Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. This is Terry Cullen. I'm gonna kick off the webinar now. So thank you so much for joining. We're very appreciative that people are this interested in LOINC and are engaged in our community. I'm gonna give some logistics to start. We are using Zoom, as you know, we had over 700 people register for this webinar. Because of that, we've made a decision to answer questions by having them posted through the website on the Q&A function in Zoom. We have turned off your ability to speak. We apologize in advance for that, but we hope that that will make the seminar and the webinar go smoother as we go along. Um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Peter Emby. For those of you who are aware of Reagan Street, Dr. Emby is the president and CEO of Reagan Street Institute. Uh, he's a professor of medicine. You can see his uh, credentials here, and we're very glad uh, for his support and for his engagement in this work. And with that, Peter, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Terry. Can I just confirm that you can hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Excellent. Thank you. And hopefully the internet uh, doesn't get in the way. Thank you all um, for, for being here. I just want to join Terry and the team in, in welcoming you. Um, this is a critically important time, obviously, and a very important um, session. So I, I really appreciate this. I'm just going to say a few words um, about the Institute for those who may not know about it. And um, uh, and then I'll say a little bit uh, uh, about this, uh, this amazing team. So um, for those who don't know, the Institute um, started in 1969, so we're celebrating our 50th anniversary. Actually, we're just concluding that. We were one of the places where the first uh, electronic health records was invented and implemented. Um, we've conducted fundamental research and development in not only how to develop and deploy health IT solutions, but also, uh, importantly, uh, we have a mission to uh, improve health. And so how do we leverage health IT, not only for local but for national and global efforts, uh, including through our Global Health Informatics team, the development of uh, what is now an independent and one of the most robust uh, health information exchanges in the country, and of course the development of LOINC that um, was led here but of course included many, many people and the extraordinary accomplishments across our teams in informatics, health services research, and aging research. You all can learn more about the Institute on our website, but I just wanted to point it out because I know some folks are not as familiar Today, the Regan Street Institute uh, houses uh, 63 primary faculty investigators, over 100 affiliates, uh, most of whom are um, faculty at our adjoining universities, the Indiana University and uh, Purdue. We also have um, over 175 full-time staff who work every day to advance the important work of our institute. Uh, and of course, the institute includes the Regan Street-based LOINC team that helps to lead this extraordinary community and have since it was developed over 25 years ago um, under the leadership uh, when it started of one of my predecessors, Dr. Clem McDonald and his many collaborators, really too many to mention, who, who uh, kicked off and developed this uh, critically important uh, community and resource. Uh, we feel that the work of the Institute is even more important now than it's ever been. And as a nonprofit applied research institute, uh, we leverage the support we have from various sources as well as the considerable expertise and capabilities we have locally as well as through our collaborations with our partners across Indiana, across the state and the nation and the world to uh, achieve our mission, which is to connect and innovate for better health for all. Um, I also wanna take a moment to just recognize the incredible work that has gone into this particular uh, session today and all of the work that is done every day by the incredible LOINC team led by Perry and Swapna. Um, it takes a lot to do what they do every day. And if anything, the last few weeks have taught us that crises like this um, are times for, for groups like uh, them and, and communities like you to shine and have a great impact. Um, we couldn't do this important work without uh, the support also of our sponsors. And so I also wanna recognize uh, the sponsors of this event and of the link generally. Uh, it's critical to the important work that the link community does. And we, we really appreciate that. Um, I'll conclude by saying that I recognize as we all do that this is an absolutely unprecedented time. Um, it's an incredibly stressful time for everyone, but I think it's also remarkable how uh, it is a time when people like this community step up to do the amazing work that you do for the world. And honestly, it's not hyperbole to say that 
at this critical moment for our world, um, this community's work, the Loink community, is absolutely essential. And it's not an overstatement to say that the work of this community is saving lives every day. Uh, and I know a lot of people may not appreciate that, but we certainly do. And uh, I just want you to know that it's absolutely the case. So if you ever question it, please don't. Um, this, this effort is critical to uh, saving lives and helping us uh, keep the world healthy. Uh, and I personally want to thank you all for your tireless and dedicated work in enabling the health of our world and, uh, and particularly during times of crisis like this. So thank you all. Um, I'm sure this will be a phenomenal day and there's a lot of important work to be done. So um, I hope you enjoy the conference and uh, I'll hand it back over to Terry. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Peter. That was wonderful. Uh, with that, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the LOINC team members. I would be remiss to not echo what Peter said about Dr. McDonald, who was a visionary and was able to predict, understand from a very prescient perspective how critical standard terminology was, especially in this space. Um, in addition, Dan Freeman, who, uh, as many of you know, led LOINC for a very long time, I want to give accolades to him and praise for being able to create this team. I'm an interloper in the team. I'm an interim director. I usually work in global health informatics. Um, as you can see here, I share that title with Swapna, who is an amazing teacher and will teach you amazing things today, as she does every day for me. And then you can see our other members of our team. I'll just, I want to name them very briefly. John, April, Sarah, David, Tim, Jamie, Brene, Brittany, and Stephen Waggers. Um, what you see at the top is a LOINC director TBD. As you may be aware, we are advertising for a LOINC director that hit our jobs page uh, earlier this week. And so if anybody's interested in that, we would encourage you to apply. Obviously, I think by the end of this webinar, what you'll see is how critical that role could be to lead this amazing small but mighty team, a team that responds on the dime and is agile and makes sure that we can produce the work that Peter talked about. With that, I want to go through the agenda. The agenda is a jam-packed agenda. We've tried to put times on it. Please uh, understand that there may be some flexibility in those times, uh, but let me just briefly go through this. So Swapna will talk about the nomenclature. I have to say, as I said to her late last night, oh, I finally learned where COVID-19 came from, and I'm sure she's going to teach all of you, some of you, or the vast majority of you may already know. We're going to talk about how we collaborate with public health and other SDOs. We're going to talk about term processing, communication of information related to terminology so everyone can stay up on the latest. The content will be in the, that will be in the June release embedded in there is also how we use pre-release and you will get an update on that and what that means. And then we have the Association of Public Health Labs. We have the Office of the National Coordinator. We have SNOMED. And finally, we have Stan, who's the CMIO, many of you know, Stan Huff at Intermountain. Stan will share what they are doing at Intermountain currently with COVID-19 overall, and then specifically talk about terminology. So what this day is really designed to do, these three hours, is to get you up to speed on what the nomenclature is, what LOINC has done, what LOINC plans on doing, and the work we have done in relationship with other SDOs and other people that are working in this space, like APHL and ONC. Once again, you will see that there is tremendous work going on. We will, there are places where we will ask you for your help in terms of perhaps letting us uh, or working with us to let us know what terms need to be developed, how we can share your information. But the day is really designed to take you from, here's what terminology is, here's how we do it with LINK, Here's what people are doing out there in response to the COVID-19 epidemic, and here's what one individual facility is doing. Uh, we will make all the slides available. Uh, there also, if you came on early, there was a slide in our rotating slide set that talked about how you can uh, use the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen. Please do that. We will be monitoring those questions as we go along. We There is a ability on that to upvote, which means if you really want that question answered, 
hit it because as you see, we've only allowed 15 minutes for Q&A. That's because of the tremendous amount of information we wanted to share with all of you. So with that, I just want to talk very, very briefly about the role of standard terminology and epidemic response and why it matters. I'm not going to belabor this. If you're on this call, you already know this. I was active duty public health service officer for 27 years, retired a few years ago from the PHS, had multiple epidemic responses, uh, at least seven, worked closely with CDC, with state epi. I was the CIO for Indian Health Service and in the late, in the early 2000, integrated LOINC into our health IT system because of some work that was going on with the recognition that we were unable to track early sentinel awareness because we did not have standard terminology. What I've listed here are the components of an epidemic response. They are not everything, but hopefully you will find the work that you do embedded in one of these categories or perhaps across all of them. Epidemiology, prediction, transmission, prevention, clinical symptomatology, diagnosis, treatment, intervention. For those who, of you who have been tracking the CDC case report and, and PUI stuff, and for those of you, excuse me, and for those of you who have also been looking at other information, you know that terminology is critical for us to be able to share and make sure that the data is accurate. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Swapna. Uh, many of you, I think, know Swapna. I'm going to let you introduce uh, her. I'm going to let her introduce herself. But let me tell you, I just want to publicly thank her because it's been a pleasure to work with her the last six months as the co-director of LOINC. And she's an amazing leader. So thank you, Terry, for that introduction. Um, OK, so um, as Terry said, so I'm Swapna Abiyankar, and I'm the Interim Director of Content Development and Operations. And as Terry mentioned, we are looking for a permanent director. Um, and so I would be happy to speak with anyone um, about that position if they're interested. Um, but my piece of this, uh, the session today is going to be actually in its two sections. So first, uh, right now, I'll be talking about um, the SARS-CoV-2 nomenclature and also some related nomenclature, and then um, how we've been working with other organizations on this terminology. And then I'll be uh, switching over to Jamie Deckard for um, her to talk about how we create new terms and how that process has changed uh, during this pandemic. And then um, She'll uh, flip back to me and then I'll sort of finish up the link piece um, by talking about communication and how um, or what content will be in the June release. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and get started with the nomenclature. So just to make sure everybody is on the same page to start out. So this is the current SARS-CoV-2 nomenclature. So the virus name is Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2, um, also known as SARS Coronavirus 2 and SARS CoV 2 is the abbreviation. That virus is actually in a species that's called SARS related coronavirus. And this will become important, you'll see in a few slides, because it has um, direct effect on how we create link terms and what we call what's being measured in the component of the link term. The disease name is COVID-19, and that was created based on coronavirus disease 2019. And so one thing that I just want to point out is that the virus SARS coronavirus 2 is the virus that causes the disease COVID-19. And in LOINC, because all of the tests are looking for the virus, that's why we use SARS coronavirus 2 in the test name because the tests are looking for the virus, not for the disease. The disease is different. So that being said, just a little bit about how the name has evolved for this virus. So, you know, in the very first reports, it was called Wuhan virus for uh, where it originated. Um, then in, um, you know, in January, it was, uh, sort of identified or started being called the 2019 novel coronavirus because it was identified as a coronavirus, but not yet identified as the particular type. And then there was this in between few days where the virus itself was known as COVID-19. 
And that happened because when uh, the WHO, which is responsible for disease names, they announced the uh, disease name is COVID-19, but then that got picked up as the name of the virus. So I think there's still some of that misconception out there that the virus name is COVID-19, when in fact, it's actually the illness caused by the virus. Um, and then finally, uh, the name that, uh, the official name that we have today, the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2, that name um, was actually uh, created by the International Committee on the Taxonomy of Viruses, or ICTV. And that organization is responsible for all virus classification and species level naming. And there's actually a group of virologists um, that actually come up with the very specific name, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2, um, based on many things that we won't go into. But anyway, I just wanted to do an overview of who decides the names and how they've evolved. Um, in terms of the species name evolution, so remember the species uh, is named SARS-related coronavirus. And so this actually started in 2003 when the um, SARS coronavirus was identified as the causative agent for SARS. And at that time, um, SARS coronavirus was classified as a species um, in the genus coronavirus. Then in 2009, basically, um, scientists had discovered, you know, many other uh, SARS-related coronaviruses in addition to the original one. And so the entire species was actually renamed to SARS-related CoV. And it was reclassified under a new genus. And then in 2018, they reclassified again under a new subgenus, uh, Sarbeco virus. And so that basically is based on SAR for SARS, and then the BE is the beta coronavirus, and then, you know, and then covirus. And so just to reiterate, SARS CoV, the original one, SARS CoV 2, the current uh, virus that's causing the pandemic, these are just two viruses in the SARS related CoV species. And I have links actually at the bottom of my slides, which will be posted after this talk. So if you want to see, you know, and go to ICTV and see any of this information, um, I have the links there. I want to just say a little bit about MERS because there have been um, some questions that have come up about MERS and the relationship to SARS. And so the MERS virus, which stands for Middle East Respiratory Syndrome Related Coronavirus, was identified in 2015 as the causative agent for MERS. And it was originally classified with SARS-related CoV in that beta coronavirus uh, genus, which had been created in 2009. But then in 2018, they split the two into the SARBECO virus and MERBECO virus for SARS uh, and MERS, respectively. And so this next slide, I'm not gonna go through the whole thing, but I just wanna point out here is um, SARS-related coronavirus, and it's the only species contained in this Sarbeco virus subgenus currently. And then up here is the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome-related coronavirus. And all of the other human coronaviruses are sort of scattered throughout these different, um, you know, genus and species. And so um, some of the other named coronaviruses that you've probably seen link codes for or that are common on respiratory panels and are common causes of uh, illness during the wintertime of, you know, respiratory infections, those are all somewhere in this classification, but they're not actually included under uh, SARS-related coronavirus. Okay, so just to summarize, and I realized that was um, a lot of information about uh, virus naming. Um, so SARS-CoV-2 is in the genus beta coronavirus, the subgenus Sarbeco virus, species SARS-related coronavirus, and this species, which is uh, right here, this is from the NCBI uh, virus taxonomy browser. This uh, species actually contains hundreds of uh, individual viruses including SARS-CoV, SARS-CoV-2, and then lots of other SARS-like coronaviruses, including you can see, um, you know, all these different bat coronaviruses, um, which is where SARS and uh, SARS-CoV-2 are thought to originate from. Okay, so then why did I just go through all that? So 
the bottom line is, um, you know, all of that was uh, sort of a preamble or an explanation for how we tend to name things in LOINC or why the tests are named the way they are. So if you see a LOINC term that has SARS coronavirus in the component, that test is specific for the original SARS-CoV, so the virus that was responsible for SARS that was identified in 2003. If you see tests with the name SARS coronavirus 2, those tests are specific for the current virus that's causing the pandemic, uh, SARS CoV 2. And then this is really important. So if you see a test that says SARS related coronavirus, that test is not looking specifically for SARS CoV 2 or even SARS CoV and SARS CoV 2. It's looking for any of the viruses in that species. And so that would include you know, SARS CoV, CoV 2, all of the bat SARS like coronaviruses. And they, most tests, so the molecular tests that are looking for any SARS related coronavirus, are basically looking for a set of nucleic acids um, you know, in the viral genome that are conserved or the same across all of the viruses in uh, that species. Um, and so that species is also, because it's the only species in the Starbecovirus subgenus, um, some of these assays are called pan Starbecovirus. And I also want to point out that we originally named the components for these tests SARS coronavirus plus SARS like coronavirus plus SARS coronavirus 2, but ultimately all of that boils down to the SARS related coronavirus species um, and that's the most accurate name and so we've actually updated the original terms that had you know this whole long thing um, to say SARS related coronavirus. Um, okay. All right, so switching gears a little bit from the nomenclature uh, that was just setting the stage. Um, and so now I just want to spend a few minutes talking about um, our work with other uh, organizations on you know, creating this new terminology. And so um, our very first efforts were um, with CDC. So on January 24th, actually I'm back and you know, looked at all our emails and things. And uh, Jamie Deckard, one of the LOINC content developers actually reached out to CDC about creating LOINCs for the test kit that was listed on the CDC website. Um, and then, you know, CDC, was definitely interested. Uh, we looped in the FDA and APHL. And then at the same time, Public Health Ontario submitted a new link request. So they were actually the first ones to actually request a new link code for um, the uh, SARS-CoV-2. And then basically over the next week, we were closely with you know, all of these different groups just to figure out what exactly they were testing and how they were reporting and what types of specimens were being tested and you know, just gathering lots of information. And then on January 31st, so a week later, we published our first set of terms that represent the US CDC test kit. And I, I said the original one because um, shortly thereafter, actually one of the tests from the original kit was removed. And so that's why I just wanted to put that caveat in. Um, but, and Public Health Ontario assays, and those were published on the LOINC pre-release page. And for any of you on the call who have, you know, requested LOINC terms, you know that, you know, typically um, the turnaround time is, you know, on average several months. And so the fact that we were able to, you know, we contacted them the 24th and then published the terms on the 31st, um, I think is just, sort of very telling about our response, um, you know, during this situation. And then um, we also have been in touch with other standards development organizations. So we've been in touch with uh, WHO um, to get input about, you know, the ICE codes, uh, naming of the tests, and then um, for people who have been monitoring their website, you can see that there's a lot of different uh, assays listed on the WHO website from different countries and manufacturers. Um, and so we uh, were in touch with them to get their input on some of these issues. Um, we worked with SNOMED International um, together to, you know, create um, a press release to, you know, disseminate information on new SNOMED codes and link codes related to COVID and SARS COVID-2. Um, and I just wanted to point out that we have, you know, we've, we've been in talks with SNOMED and um, just as a sneak peek, you know, we are working on um, a new and updated agreement um, and are looking forward to collaborating with them. 
Um, we have links to all of the other SDO information pages on our FAQ page that I'm actually going to show a little bit more during uh, my second portion of the talk. And we've been updating that and adding links as we've learned about them. And we have links to, you know, SOMED and the WHO site and CDC and FinBads and APHL, um, also CPT codes and ICD codes. Um, if we're missing anything or you find that the links aren't working or, you know, there's something else that we should be listing that we haven't, please let us know and we will um, update the page. And we've been updating it um, nearly every day or a couple times a day, actually. So we would definitely add that information. Um, and then this is just a screenshot of, um, you know, the terminologies across SDOs. And I just want to point out that, you know, it is complementary. And so, SNOMED CT has codes for the disorder, the organism, the substance, um, a procedure code for vaccination um, when that, that becomes available. Um, ICD-10 is used for diagnoses. CPT is used for billing in the US. And um, again, LOINC is used for the, you know, the testing. Um, and then we have continued work uh, with public health. So we've been in very close touch and we've been communicating with APHL basically, you know, every day regarding new tests that are coming out and appropriate link assignments. And it's actually been really nice to, you know, have um, another group to sort of talk to and confirm that what we're thinking is uh, in line with what they are thinking in terms of coding and uh, link assignments. Um, and then just this morning, actually, um, I got an email from somebody at CDC about um, potentially figuring out which link codes uh, should be used for data elements on the person under investigations or PUI form. And um, actually, here's a little small request. So if anyone has already mapped any of these data elements from the PUI form to standards such as LOINC or SNOMED, um, if you could contact us so that we can uh, put you in touch with the right people at the CDC, because they're interested in doing this. And if the work has already been done, then it would be great to share and work together. And then finally, um, we've been working. So, you know, after the sort of the initial set of terms was created in January, uh, we started to get a lot of requests for uh, new test kits that have been approved um, either by IVD manufacturers or uh, reference labs, so lab developed tests. And we've worked with, um, many different manufacturers and laboratories and organizations, uh, both in the US and outside the US. And we've been sort of continuously publishing um, the pre-release uh, terms. And just yesterday, we actually updated the pre-release page with uh, two new terms that were posted. One is another molecular test and one is the first uh, antigen uh, test code that we created. Um, so I'm going to stop there and actually turn it over to Jamie uh, to talk about the process for um, how we, uh, you know, how we get submissions and how we process those. So, um, so again, my name's Jamie, or Jamie Lynn is my uh, full name, but I go by Jamie uh, Deckard, and I'm one of the Loink content developers at Regan Street Institute. So, and I'm going to talk about um, our typical LOINC term creation process, just to give everyone an idea of how the work typically happens and then what's in our current queue. Um, but then I'm gonna go over, you know, what we've done for special use codes and the recommendations on those, and then talk about some of the differences between the term names, um, and then also go over mapping to the SARS-CoV-2 LOINC codes. So with our typical term creation process, um, we actually have new requests that are received almost daily from LOINC users. Um, they're processed in most cases in the order that they're received. We do have special contracts where those might take precedent depending on the um, particular project. Um, but then also this case, as you see, the special usage or emergent conditions where those terms obviously are processed much more quickly. But our usual process is where as the request comes in, we process them typically in that order. Um, and then the turnaround time currently is about three or, or more months on average. Um, it can take a little bit less if we have all the information that we need, um, or it can take quite a bit longer if it's a new concept, um, or we're you know, going back and forth with questions and it's not you know, quite clear uh, what, 
the particular test or observation is that we need to represent. Um, and then new codes are published on the pre-release page, usually monthly. Um, so for submitting new term requests, we have a couple ways to do that, um, where submitters you know, provide us with all the information. Um, we have a web page that you can go to, and this within each of the slides here is actually a direct link to these pages. Um, so if you want to review that later after you go after we send out these slides. Um, but one way is to use our online term request form, and then we provide lots of information on all the you know information that we need for each test. Other ways that users submit to us is using our Realma tool. There's actually a way within that tool to provide a request um, that can be submitted directly to us or by email. And then we have several spreadsheets or submission templates online that users may use, depending on the use case. We have basic ones, we have lab-focused templates, um, we have templates that are specific for survey instruments or forms, and then we also have a radiology um, submission template. So our current queue, um, this also is available on, on loink.org, where you can look at the number of requests or submissions that are currently active in our queue. So on this slide, and this is a couple days old, but um, we had around 143 active submissions. And then within those submissions, we had a total of over about 1,400 terms that are currently in process. So they're actively being processed. Um, and then the, there are terms that we process that are, are potentially copyrighted and we have to seek copyright approval. Um, and we highlight those just because those can take significantly longer to process, uh, depending on you know, working with the IP holder and getting permission and everything. Um, and then the fourth one there, the links created since the last release, that represents the total number, total number of links that we've processed um, and in this case, since December. And then the last one is the median turnaround time, which is about 114 days currently. Um, the graph on the bottom, I'm not gonna go over in detail, but um, it does show you in 2019, we had 366 requests or submissions that came through that contained over 4,000 you know, links within each of them. So it kind of highlights how we get requests almost daily on average for new terms. If you want to actually look at the, the details of what's in the queue and um, what's actively being processed, we have a web page for that as well. Um, and that shows you the current status for every single term that is um, in process. Um, it shows you the unique ID that we signed for each of those as well as the unique submission ID or set, set ID um, that's shown here. And then it tells you the class um, so we have just a little symbol for lab versus clinical versus radiology. Um, and then we have the component, property, time, system, scale, and method, all the pieces of the LOINC term. And then if um, the term has been, has gone through the QA review process um, and has been assigned a LOINC, then we provide that LOINC code um, here as well as that same term then, um, as we update the pre-release page, is then posted on the pre-release page. Um, here is where users, LOINC users, or those who submit their submissions, this is where they can go to view their current, you know, their set of requests um, and what's, you know, the status of each of those. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me go back. I jumped too far. Um, and then also on the same page, you can search the queue because obviously you can see it's quite um, long. And so there's a way to search either by the um, ID or the set itself, the, the submission ID, um, or any of the you know, component name or system, things like that. So you can search on a variety of things on this page. So for processing of new term requests, um, what we do is when we receive a request, we do that initial intake and we review all of the supporting materials that they provided. Um, if we have questions for them, we send those back. Um, if we need more information, um, we'll ask specifics, you know, as far as, you know, sample reports, things, things like that. 
Um, and then once we have everything we need, we load this into our internal um, homebrew blank submission system, which is absolutely awesome. Our developers have done an amazing job with um, putting this together for us. Um, and then each submission and uh, requested term is assigned a unique ID, which I showed you there on that submission queue details page. Uh, the submissions are assigned like various statuses as they go through the process. So we have submission requests that come in that are new, and then once they've been approved to process, they go to a pending status until someone picks it up, um, one of the content developers to process that request. And then it goes through the process of um, reviewing all the terms, doing the work that's needed for those prior to then submitting them for QA review. And we have an internal and external review process for QA. Um, and so online in that previous slide that I showed you, you can see and follow the statuses for each of these terms. And the final status would be done then. And then all new terms um, that have completed QA review, um, or all new terms that we do process and create, they have gone through that internal and external QA review. Uh, just to get a little idea of the work behind the scenes as far as what needs to be done for a given term, um, in some cases we have to create new parts for that term. Um, and we also review the display names that are generated. Um, they are auto-generated, but they are dependent upon how we have our rules built and the parts that we create. So it does take review for each of those. Um, we build answer lists if needed. Um, in some cases, we're able to use existing answer lists. We uh, determine the example units, <clears throat> excuse me, <coughs> the um, example UCOM units and then the, just exam the regular example units that we provide. Those are based on the submission, the original submission that's provided, but also, <clears throat> um, you know, an internal review as well and determining what should be displayed. Uh, we may create term and part descriptions. We provide synonyms for the terms or the parts. Uh, we sometimes hook up related codes if that's relevant. We assign tags like the special usage tag um, or veterinary tag, public health. Um, infectious disease, things like that we may assign as well. And then there's many other, other attributes that um, go along with kind of the behind the scenes and putting the term, all the pieces together for each link code. So for special use term requests, these are developed in response to an urgent or emergent situation such as the infectious disease outbreak. Um, so you can see there a list of just over the years, how many um, different pandemic or epidemics have occurred where LOINC was involved in creating codes um, for each of those. These requests may be initiated by us, the team, like in the case with working with CDC or from other users, like when Ontario um, Public Health, you know, submitted their requests and then all the other vendors have been um, manufacturers and other public health labs have been submitting requests um, since then. The special usage terms are expedited, so within a 24 to 48 hour turnaround is pretty typical. Um, some of the requests we've been doing in a day to get them back so that they have those ready to go. The, they do re complete a QA review, so they do go through uh, multiple steps where people do review them um, prior to publishing or pre-releasing those codes. And then once they are published on the pre-release page, they have that special usage label. Um, one comment about the expedited uh, turnaround time, we, you know, work with everyone to try to get, you know, all the information that's needed and sometimes it can take a little bit longer depending on, you know, needing to clarify whether existing codes are, um, represent the ex actual test that's being done. Uh, we need to figure out with the source or the system, the specimens that are being tested. So all of that can kind of come into play as how quickly we can uh, provide that code back to the user. Once that user has that code um, for special use terms, we um, do highlight that it is not part of the official LOINC release yet. So therefore, you know, you can't directly download it from our website, but you can copy and paste um, from that pre-release page and use it in your system. Um, we, as Swapna mentioned, these terms will be published in our next um, LOINC June release. But until then, we really 
recommend keeping track of updates. And there is an email, um, when we go to that pre-release page, I can show you the link for that email, but there is a way to sign up to get uh, notifications if any new terms have been posted, and any new special use terms have been posted to the pre-release page, or if there's been any changes to the names of those pre-release special use codes. Um, so we really recommend keeping track of that, making sure on top of that, especially if you've taken these codes and, and implemented them into your system. And we do have this claim or disclaimer on the website that says, you know, as we had highlighted, that they are developed in response to this emergent um, or urgent situation. And in general, LOINC does support the use um, in this unique situation that resulted in that rapid creation. However, we all need to keep in mind that, you know, this is a evolving process. Um, everybody's working really hard to kind of implement all of these new codes. And, and when they're not in sync with the typical process, like with the releases, it can be challenging. And so downstream users may not be ready for those. Um, codes at this time. So it's just something to keep in mind as far as how we implement things and what can we do to improve um, the use of codes like this um, across all different standards um, so that we can all communicate during the emergent situations. Um, so all other pre-release codes that we provide in general, they're there just for informational purposes. We provide these codes back to our submitters right away so that they have them and they can begin implementing them. Um, in some cases, it's very helpful to have them part of, for instance, some implementation guides, um, maybe some package inserts or instruction for use assays, things like that. Um, but again, with the challenges of trying to implement codes that are not yet part of official release, it can be difficult. And so in general, we state that they are there for informational purposes only. Um, the other key thing is that they are still under development by the LOINC team. As you can see with the SARS-CoV-2 codes, the name changed, you know, within weeks over time. And so we had to update all of those codes to reflect the name that was decided or determined for the virus. Um, it is possible that some of these codes may not be published in the next or any public release. And we have a section in our LOINC user's guide, um, section 11.4, that talks about kind of the background around why we uh, do pre-release codes. So you can read more about that there. All right, what I'd like to do is go to our pre-release page then and show you. Um, so currently, as, as you can see, these all have a special usage tag. And let me try to blow this up a little bit so you can see that. Um, they all show the special usage tag, um, the LOINC is provided, uh, the created on date, and then the component, property time, system scale method, and short name are provided. And I believe if you do a control A, or maybe that won't work, but you can select and you can copy all these. You can copy that and then paste them into a spreadsheet. But again, we do not provide these for a download because they are not part of official release. Um, and then also I mentioned, if you would like to receive email notices, there's the link here where you can sign up so that when any new special use code is created and um, loaded onto our pre-release site, or if any name changes, for instance, like the SARS-related coronavirus, um, those were previously called something else, you will be notified of all of those changes when they happen. Okay, and now I would like to go into a little bit more detail about each of the codes and the naming of them. And so first I'd like to talk about the component for SARS-CoV-2. This represents actually what is being tested or the analyte, the thing that is being measured, um, or represents the what is what is being reported, what is detected, what is not detected, what is positive, negative, and so on. So the codes that identify the virus currently are um, with molecular assays, we have ones that are very specific for the gene, the location of that target. And then we have other ones that are more general about just any SARS-CoV-2 RNA, regardless of what the gene target was. Um, we find those are generally more usable across assays, just because different assays have different targets. 
but um, we also think it's important early on at least right now to have codes that indicate what the very specific target was at least at the gene level we know that within genes there can be even more you know the targets can vary as far as their very exact location but at least at the gene level we feel it might be important to know and then that way later compare and see which ones were you know uh which ones detected the SARS or did not and so on so and then the antigen is we have so I'm going to mention that we have now our first link code for an antigen test. Um, that one is also used, and that has AG um, in the component here. Um, we also have some serology tests, antibody tests that are um, available. So also in the component, you'll see some terms with a plus, and that plus means that it detects both, you know, SARS-related coronavirus, for instance, and MERS, but it does not differentiate between them. So if there's a positive result for that test, it just means that it's, it's one or the other, or, you know, we, but it doesn't say which one. It just says that it's positive overall. The same thing for the antibodies with IgG and IgM. It does not distinguish between those two, um, but it means that either or could be positive. The system for SARS-CoV codes, um, they we have respiratory terms currently um, we also have some in the molecular space we also have some xxx codes so first with respiratory um, this is really the primary specimen that we're seeing that's being tested um, for upper and lower respiratory um, as you know including sputum and if your lab is testing for respiratory specimens we strongly recommend that that would be the link code that you would use uh, the specimen information also, we would recommend be sent separately in the electronic message. So if there's a way to provide, you know, use the right, the most um, specific loin code that represents that source or that specimen that was tested, as well as sending the very specific details about the source, because respiratory is just kind of general in itself, but maybe also sending, you know, that you tested sputum or you used whatever swab, also sending that information along um, in an SPM segment is or whatever um, segment is appropriate for your messaging, we would recommend that as well. Um, in some cases, some labs use a separate link code for specimen with the result of the exact specimen that was tested. So there's different ways or modeling out there, um, but we, we do recommend trying to send it both ways so that uh, all the information can be communicated. For XXX, um, these codes are created when um, either the specimen's not known or multiple specimen types can be tested, like respiratory, blood, urine, maybe an environmental specimen, stool, whatever it may be. Um, and so the codes that were created for COVID-19 testing, it really applies to that latter case where um, for CDC and some of the public health labs, um, they were anticipating and actually the original um, ad guidelines out there mentioned collecting um, serum and plasma or stool or other specimens besides respiratory um, for testing and so because of that the original codes were created with xxx with the anticipation that other specimens might be received and that specimen information would be communicated elsewhere in the electronic message We also have codes for serum or plasma, and these are generally related to the serology testing. We do anticipate additional codes um, with more specific systems will be created in the future, like maybe even more specific respiratory that distinguishes between upper versus lower, um, and then possibly urine and others. So just to keep in mind that it is quite possible that other codes will be created just depending on the usage. So the method for our source CoV2 terms, um, all of the molecular assays to date have a method of probe.amp.tar, and that represents the nucleic acid amplification of a target with a probe-based detection. Um, so we actually in the queue, we do have a request that's coming through for um, a melt curve analysis. So an assay where they amplify that target 
Um, but then rather than using a probe, they use another method like melt curve analysis to determine um, if the bacteria or if the virus is present. Uh, so you may see additional or new terms come out um, in the molecular space that are not probe AMTAR, but are more of a, a non-probe AMTAR. So just a heads up about that. Um, and then we have other terms where immunoassay and IA.rapid are the methods. And so as of um, currently, all the existing antibody tests that are out there and antigens that we have in LOINC um, are based on amino assay. And so that is why these codes have that specific method. That is also why we don't have any methodless terms where there is no method specified. And it's because that we want people to use, you know, the same LOINC code for a given test that's being done. Um, and so if we would create a LOINC code that's methodless and doesn't indicate, there's a very good chance we'll get a request from somebody that they want a code that indicates the method. And so rather than having duplicate codes, one with a method and one without, that mean pretty much the same thing at this point, you know, as far as all the testing that's being done at this point for SARS-CoV-2, we think it's important to make the, meth the terms themselves as specific um, and representative of that method that's being done. Uh, just a quick note about rapid. Um, so those are for like the lateral flow assays or things, any test that's being done within 60 minutes or less is how we define rapid in LOINC. So the property scale for LOINC, they kind of go hand in hand. Um, and when you see uh, ordinal scale or ORD, um, typically that's, a, you know, with a presence threshold property, meaning that um, the detection of an analyte or of a virus, of the RNA from a virus or whatever it might be, is sometimes based on an internal threshold in the lab. There might be a scale, but the overall result reported is positive, negative, detected, not detected, whatever it might be, such as you see with the real-time PCR assays. Um, there is that internal threshold that is used, and so our property in LOINC, PR, THR, represents that, that it's a presence or a threshold that determines that ordinal result. Um, and then I provide an example there. Um, and then some example results. And just to highlight for result reporting, we do recommend using the SNOMED CT codes when possible. Um, and if there is not a, a code that is um, representative of your result, a SNOMED CT code that's representative of your result, we do recommend submitting that um, for inclusion in SNOMED. Um, and then for th quantitative codes, um, a lot of these currently have a um, property of thresh num, which represents the cycle threshold number um, and the scale of quan for quantitative. And you can see an example there of a LOINC code for that. And then the codes that have a dash in the property and scale, these represent um, batteries or panels. And the reason why they have a dash in the property and scale is because the results that are sent um, along with this battery or this order code can vary as far as whether it's quantitative or ordinal um, or maybe an overall uh, narrative interpretation, things like that. And so uh, it just indicates that the child elements or the results underneath this panel um, will vary as far as the kinds of results that are sent. Um, so SARS-CoV-2 panel codes are only used for test orders or batteries. These should not be used for reporting results. Um, we're already seeing these codes come up in uh, messaging that are assigned to specific results. Um, and so that should not be the case. Um, so keep in mind that when you are mapping or if you're reviewing a LOINC code mapping that's um, coming through or coming to your system, result or anything that's within an OBX or anything that's being messaged and sent um, should not be a panel code itself, unless it's representing that overall collection of results. Um, so all our panel codes in LOINC have the word panel in the component and then a dash in the property typically. Um, 
they contain the collection of link codes that are used to report the results for each individual test. So um, for a real-time PCR battery or panel, we have a couple codes for respiratory specimens and then unspecified specimens. And then for antibody testing, serology, we have um, the following qualitative and quantitative result codes. And I'm gonna jump back just to show some of this here on our pre-release page. So here you can see um, our component, like this term is for that antigen test. It's done on a respiratory specimen and it's a rapid method. Um, and then here you can see this is a specific target, a gene target region, the ORF1AB region. And this test here is done on a respiratory specimen and it's a PCR or real-time PCR test where there's a probe-based uh, detection. The next code below that is an IgG, IgM. It um, does not distinguish between these two. So if the result is positive, that doesn't indicate whether it was positive for IgG, just IgM, or both. It just says that it's positive or negative. And this test is um, done by an immunoassay. I believe this request came from Mayo, actually. Um, this code here is an example of a panel code. So this is probably the most common code that would be used for an order for a SARS-CoV test when multiple results are being sent back. Um, and you can see here where the dash is in the property and scale and the system is respiratory and the method is um, probamptar. So those are just some examples, but I wanted to kind of go through and show you some of um, the link codes in relation to the component, the system, you know, the property and scale, and then also the method. And I can speak briefly on the timing. It's PT, which means um, it's just a point in time, meaning the sample was collected at that moment. Um, in some cases, we have codes in the link for 24 hour, meaning like, which is common with urine collections. There might be urine that's collected over a 24 hour period. Um, but that, that just explains why all of these are currently PT. Okay, so mapping to LOINC, um, we strongly recommend that you find out what test kit your laboratory is using. Um, if you can contact the lab or the manufacturer to determine which codes are most appropriate, uh, we would recommend doing that. That's kind of a lot of the pre-work um, because often if you take those first steps of just finding out what the kit is, um, even within a messaging system, even as you're receiving it, sometimes that information is provided within that message. So if you can find that out, you can often find out or even contact the manufacturer and some of them may post or list their um, link code online. And as Swapna mentioned, we also are trying to provide some of those on link.org. Um, that may be all you need to find out what loin code is you need to use for that given result or that given test. Um, if not, there may be more that you need to do. You, it may be that we need to determine what is being measured or reported. Is it um, a specific gene target? Is it, you know, is it RNA um, or is it an uh, antibody test? And then the specimens, what specimens are allowed for testing? If it's only respiratory, we would recommend using the respiratory codes. You would wanna determine what results are reported. Um, if it's a quantitative result, if you see a value that's being reported, um, then it potentially is just the threshold number, the cycle threshold number <clears throat> that's being detected. But if it is a positive negative result, then you would wanna map that to an ordinal code and not a quantitative code. And then also determine the method of analysis, whether it was PCR, um, maybe it was the milk curve analysis, uh, maybe it was some other um, method that's being done, an immunoassay. All of those will help you determine the right LOINC to map to. For SARS-CoV-2, right now the most common LOINC code for mapping is this um, SARS-CoV-2 RNA code that is ordinal. Um, so the presence or absence, the positive, presumptive positive, negative um, in respiratory specimen by PCR, real-time PCR. Uh, just a couple more tips with mapping. So again, panel codes 
are not, should only be used for orders and they should not be mapped to a single test or result. If your lab is running just a single test or if that single result is be, being reported out, uh, the same non-panel LOINC code, so the same LOINC code can be used for the order and the result. Um, and if we go back at this 94500-6, what this code says essentially is, you know, LOINC, we often say LOINC is a lot about what's the question. What are we asking about my patient? And the question in this case is, does my patient have SARS-CoV-2 RNA in a respiratory specimen? We're looking to see if they have any, you know, nucleic acids that represent or that are used to detect SARS-CoV-2. Um, and so if that's the question, that would be your order. That's your order code right there. If your question is, I want to know, I have a set of things I want to know, does my, pan you know, like for the CDC test, they report out, um, you know, the, the gene, the actual target information for each specific gene um, within the end gene, they report out those results and then they report out this overall or an, or an overall result. Um, and so that would be a collection of codes that are reported back. And so there might be a different code that's used for the order. But in a lot of cases, that order code is exactly the same as your result code, especially when it's a single test that's being done. Another thing is we have a lot of human coronavirus terms, and these are not the same as the SARS-related coronavirus terms. Um, this test is a lot, or these tests are commonly being done right now because it's a, well, in the US at least, because it's a wintertime respiratory infection. It's a very common one. Um, and the coronavirus terms are often part of respiratory panels and done in addition to like influenza testing. Um, these tests will not detect SARS-CoV-2 since the target is not common. And I wanna look briefly at these with everyone. So here you will see, and these, some of these are older LOINC codes and you, you know an older LOINC code based on the, the number itself. Otherwise there's no inherent meaning um, behind LOINC codes. Um, you can sort them to get the oldest or the newest. Um, this would be newer ones that have been created. These are older ones, but as you can see, all these human coronavirus terms, um, many of these are used in respiratory assays um, or tests that are being done in respiratory assays, um, but these are not the same as SARS-CoV-2. So if um, any of these come back positive, more, I mean, almost certainly this is not, that does not mean the patient has this novel coronavirus that we're testing for commonly today. Um, so just to keep in mind with that. And then the other test that we have that's getting a little bit, there's confusion around is the SARS-CoV ones that Swapna talked about. Um, and these again are different from SARS-CoV-2. It's similar, it's within the same species, but these are not, um, these do not represent SARS-CoV-2 uh, detection. Uh, so just in general, the effect of COVID-19 on new term requests. Um, so our routine submission processing, as you would imagine, has slowed, <laughs> um, mainly because we've been putting a lot of our team efforts um, onto the SARS-CoV term processing. Um, uh, we get a lot of inquiries around, you know, uh, what should we map to, um, and, you know, just general questions around uh, LOINCs and SARS and everything. So there's been a lot of attention applied to that because we want to make sure that everybody um, has what they need in order to, you know, uh, map their codes to LOINC. Um, and then any SARS term request that comes in currently, that takes priority. So as soon as it comes in, um, we process that immediately, sometimes within a day. Often it's a more 24 to 48 hour turnaround, um, but we try to process it as quickly as we can. And the goal is, is that then those labs that are implementing tests or manufacturers, the goal is that they can then take that LOINC code um, and implement it right away so that they don't have to, you know, uh, implement an internal code that is only um, has only value to them internally and otherwise outside it's not or to, when you send it to somebody else that internal code doesn't have any meaning whereas the LOINC code then can be used you know in the long term um, 
and can be communicated across labs. So that's really the goal is to try to get that link code um, out there as soon as possible and map to that test as soon as possible. Um, so it can be represented downstream to downstream users. Um, and then the median turnaround time for SARS terms is actually included in our overall. We don't currently split those out. And so it, our turnaround time for routine submissions is kind of skewed, I think, right now as far as how soon we're getting them back. We are still actively processing routine submissions. It's just that it's slowed a little bit. It's not as quick as we um, are typically turning things around. We also often get the question, can we just use this link code or is there a fee um, or, you know, is there anything we need to do, you know, in order to copy these link codes off the website and use them or to download, you know, the release files and use the information that is there. Um, so our link, we, it is of no cost use. It's used worldwide, uh, commercial, non-commercial purposes. We really encourage translation because this is what really helps with implementing uh, these codes and making them usable worldwide. Uh, we just have that one major prohibition, which is um, you cannot use any licensed material to develop or propagate a different standard for orders or observations. And you can find out more um, on link.org related to that license. We have lots of information on link.org related to our term requests, you know, what information is needed, um, that Q page that tells you um, what our stats are, what are the details of the queue. Um, on that same page related for submissions, you can find out about the, um, you can get a direct link to the pre-release page. Um, and then we, as Swapna mentioned, we, and she's gonna go over, I believe the SARS information FAQ page that we have developed to try to help address any questions that are specific to SARS, CoV-2 and LOINC. Um, and then also to you know help you identify or find links um, to other standards or organizations that are actively working on all of this. All right, so I believe now I'm going to hand it back to Swapna, um, and she's going to go over some of the uh, current work now that's being done. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Jamie. Okay, um, so I'll be talking about um, basically focused communication around the LOINC SARS-CoV-2 terminology and then also what will be included in the June release as well um, over the next 20 minutes or so. So as Jamie mentioned and showed, um, you know, we have a pre-release page where we update it uh, for terms that are created in between releases. And so typically we update the pre-release page about once a month, um, but right now we're updating it much more frequently, um, sometimes a couple times a week. Um, and actually we updated it yesterday. And to make it easier so that users don't have to just kind of keep coming back to the website to see if it's been updated, um, we've been sending out tweets every time we update the page. And then also we created a special mailing list for people who want to receive uh, information about when the, just the special use pre-release content is updated. So um, we're not going to send you information about non-special use uh, pre-release codes because those are routinely updated about once a month, but this is just for special use codes. If new codes are added or codes are updated, then we will be um, sending out emails about that. And you can sign up for that list. So this is just a screenshot of the pre-release page that Jamie showed and you can sign up uh, for that list here um, where it says receive email notices. And um, we actually sent out uh, an email this morning um, based on the codes that were added yesterday. And these are just some screenshots from that email. So you can see we have some information about uh, pre-release terms. And then a couple of examples, and I actually don't know if this is big enough for you to see, but we have two new terms. One is for the SARS-CoV-2 antigen, 
and the other one is for um, a molecular test that's targeting the ORF1 AB region in respiratory specimens. So we have both of those new terms uh, included on the pre-release page. And then um, some, there are a handful of terms that were updated, and that's one of the reasons why we don't actually, you know, provide downloads or haven't actually, you know, officially released these terms in terms of having a public release yet, because this is, uh, you know, work in evolution. And so there are some pieces of information that are kind of trickling in. Um, and so we want to make sure that everything's kind of finalized before we officially release the terms. And so for the first term, and again, I apologize if this is too small, but basically this, um, this update shows the uh, change from the component SARS coronavirus plus SARS-like coronavirus plus SARS-like coronavirus 2 to just SARS-related coronavirus RNA, um, as we discussed previously, because it's more accurate. And then the second page for a different term shows that uh, for a couple of terms, we realized that all of the uh, methods that were used to detect individual IgG and IgM uh, levels or the presence of IgG or IgM are all done by rapid immunoassay. And so we updated those terms to rapid. The one term, the IgG plus IgM that um, Jimmy pointed out, that one did not get updated because that one is not done by a rapid method. Uh, but anyway, so if you want to, um, you know, stay up to date on our special use uh, pre-release terms, then you can go ahead and sign up for the email. Um, and so, as you can imagine, we've been getting lots and lots of questions related to um, to this topic, um, including, you know, the difference between the virus and the disease, and the difference between all of the different viruses within the species. Um, and which terms to use for orders and results. And then we also were looking up lots of information. Um, like, you know, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what the difference was between SARS-related COVID and SARS-like COVID um, and all of the specific viruses. And so at some point it just made sense to actually put all of that information together onto a dedicated FAQ page so that people could review the information and then of course, you know, still send questions if there were questions, but at least that way the information was there, um, you know, both for us as well as for the community as well. Um, and so I, let's see, so I'm just gonna go here um, and let me make it a little bit bigger. So here, um, basically it's just um, blank.org slash SARS dash coronavirus dash two. And so you can see here at the top of the page, uh, well, we have information regarding this meeting. So this part will be um, going away after this meeting is over. But then right at the top, we have all of these links that are related to terminology or other important information about SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19. Um, and so you can see, you know, some CT, ICD-10, CT, information links for WHO, CDC, uh, FinBads, and APHL. And like I said before, if there are, um, you know, if there are links or information that you think should be on this page and isn't, or if you find a link isn't working, please let us know so we can update it. Um, but anyway, so basically, so this page goes through, um, you know, some general information. So like we covered before, what's the difference between SARS coronavirus 2 and COVID-19? What's the difference between all these different, uh, you know, viruses? Um, this section actually is going to get to in a couple of slides, but we've actually gotten permission from several manufacturers to include information about which blanks correspond to their test kits on our webpage. And we requested to do that just because we want to make it as easy as possible for people to use the correct code so that we can track this thing and, um, you know, get accurate information. And so um, basically we have the manufacturer and test kit, the result links, in some cases we have the order links as well. Um, and then, you know, whatever text the manufacturer wanted us to include um, regarding a special notice, and you can see it's different for a lot of them. Um, if you are a manufacturer and you would like your information listed on our page, um, again, just please contact us. And we've been updating this, uh, like I said, you know, every day and multiple times a day. Um, after that, we have, um, some general 
sort of guidance on, okay, if my test kit isn't listed there, uh, which link should I use? And so it, this goes over a lot of information that um, Jamie already provided, so I'm not going to go through it in detail. But I just want to show you, you know, we have a table for um, showing the different analytes, and the first section is just the molecular tests uh, for respiratory specimens and unspecified specimens, and then which codes you would use for the specific analytes, and then for qualitative versus quantitative uh, results. And if you click on one of these, it'll just take you to the uh, details page for that term, which right now has fairly limited information, but I'll be talking about that as well in a minute. Um, and then underneath, we have um, the tests looking for the antibodies. Um, so we have those codes listed. Now that we have an antigen code, um, I'm updating the page to add that as well. Um, we have information about low ink panel codes, um, all of the stuff that Jamie reviewed about, you know, XXX versus respiratory, and then um, which link code to use from the CDC test. And so for that, we actually point to um, APHL's website because they have a really nice spreadsheet that lists all of the codes that can be used for the orders and the, um, and the results as well. Um, and then we have, you know, just a few more questions about, um, or sorry, questions and answers about um, why do all of the existing terms have specific methods and why didn't we create methodless codes, um, and then how you can download them. And then um, basically, so, you know, it, so we published this and then um, we were still getting a lot of questions though, which made sense because our questions were not related to the information currently on the page. And so we actually created a dedicated mailbox uh, for SARS-CoV-2 that we link to from here or the contact us page. Um, and actually there's a, a question that we submitted um, a little while ago about when do you email this you know, particular email address versus send uh, email with a submission. And so that, that's a great question. And so this uh, special email box, and here, let me just on that. So this is the contact us uh, our contact link page. And you can see the first box, when I clicked on that, because it was already on the SARS FTP page, it automatically highlighted uh, this box here, which is SARS CoV 2. Um, but basically, if there's questions about which codes to use or something else related to SARS CoV 2, then you would submit a question through here. If you have a submission or request for new codes, then you would go through our typical submission process. And so, you know, and we have a way just to move the emails as well. So if you send it to the wrong place by mistake, we can just move it. But in general, this email box should be used for questions and then the submission should be used for, um, for submissions or new requests. Um, okay, so this, whoops. Okay, and so we already covered this. Um, oh yeah, and we're getting questions all sorts of ways. So, you know, contact us, lots of people's emails, the Fire Zulip chat, and, you know, different methods as well. Um, and then the slide I already talked about where we wanted to include uh, information about different test kits. Um, and so we've also been monitoring the uh, FDA site and the emergency use authorization listings. And you know, we've been trying to reach out to as many manufacturers as we can. We're working with um, APHL and others to you know, reach out and get more information so that we can create appropriate codes or list codes if we get permission. Um, but again, if you don't see your product listed and you would like it to be, um, go ahead and just uh, And then some work in progress. Um, so a question that's come up several times is actually on the one details page. Um, you know, right now it's very basic. So this is a, just a screenshot of the term as it appears now. And you know, you basically have the link number and then you have the six main parts, the component, property, time, scale, and method. Um, it doesn't really provide much other information but we are actually in the middle of adding more information, including term descriptions and answer lists and related names um, or synonyms uh, to these pre-release details pages. And we think that will really help users differentiate between the different terms 
um, and just understand their meaning a little bit better and uh, help figure out which terms to use. So, you know, so watch for that in the next, um, you know, in the next, I would say, week or so. Um, you don't hold me to that, but most likely in the next week or thereabouts. Um, and so, whoops, oh, and one thing I wanted to point out was that the, um, the URL for this page doesn't change. So for 94500-6, you can always get to it just by typing in link.org slash 94500-6, um, regardless of whether it's in the pre-release stage or in the final published stage. And um, if you've looked at uh, like details pages for published terms, you'll know that they look quite different. Um, but the nice thing is that the, you know, the address is the same. The other thing we're working on is um, trying to figure out the best way to provide some pre-release content via the FHIR terminology server. Um, and I'm not going to go into a lot of details about this, but it's, it's something that we're working through. If you are a FHIR expert and have some ideas or recommendations uh, for how best to do this, please let us know. Right now, the link, uh, FHIR terminology server contents are updated twice a year, so usually in June and December with the official release. And we're trying to figure out if we can uh, either create like a special use value set or um, you know, add just a subset of contents uh, to the code system resource. And we actually have created a special use value set, but some of the operations aren't working because the terms aren't in the code system resource. Um, and again, I'm not going to go into uh, more detail than that, but if you may have a solution or ideas, uh, please uh, let us know, and that would be great. OK, so then finally, I wanted to end with um, blank content related to SARS-CoV-2 that will be in the June release. And so just a quick overview of the link release cycle. So um, like I just said, we usually have twice yearly official releases, usually in June and December. And when a lot of people think about link, you know, they just think about the main table or search link, but we actually publish a ton of other information uh, with each release, including you know, all of the part information for any part that's related to any link term. We publish answer lists. We publish uh, like a panels and forms file, which has the relationships between, you know, um, basically we have panels of terms. And so the particular links that are in the panels and the answer lists that are attached to those. Uh, we have something called blank groups, which I'll talk about in a minute, multi-axial hierarchy, and actually many other files as well. And so um, we've also gotten a question about, well, why haven't you had a, you know, an official release, like an off cycle official release for these terms? And really there's two reasons. One is because we keep adding new terms. Um, you know, like we just added the first antigen term yesterday and I imagine over the next couple months, there's gonna be a lot of new codes added. And so it wouldn't make sense just to keep doing one off interim releases. Um, because I think it would be it would be a lot of work for us and for implementers to have to keep updating, um, you know, all of their link content. And then the second reason is because we're not just publishing the link table. We have you know all of these other files, and we have a you know pretty robust validation process uh, before each release that takes time and effort uh, because we want to make sure that you know things that go out are you know clean and correct. Um, and so it would just take a lot more, you know, effort to do an interim release um, than I think necessarily meets the eye. And so those are sort of the basic two reasons why we're not, um, at least at this point, we have not um, decided to put out an interim release. Um, when we do publish a release, we usually send emails and tweets and post lots of messages on our website. And if you would like um, information, or if you would like to be notified when a release goes out, you can sign up for a regular mailing list, um, and you know, and you'll get an email basically when the release is official. Um, and that's different from our pre-release uh, special use emails. So, um, of course, all of these terms are going to be in the June release. And I just want to point out that once they're in the official release, they will not be listed on the pre-release page anymore. And so right now, it's actually kind of handy to be able to go to the pre-release page, 
sort nicely at the top because we've sorted by special use status. Um, but you know, once they're in the June release, that page will no longer have these codes. Um, so just sort of a reminder about that. And all of the terms will be in, you know, all of our usual publication um, artifacts. So the link table, they'll be available in Realma, in the online search application, as well as the fire terminology server. And like I mentioned before, all of the details pages, uh, URLs remain the same. So link.org slash and then whatever the link number is. Um, so our releases also include link parts. And so just a quick um, overview of link parts, um, and probably many of you are already familiar with this, but just as a reminder, each value um, for, you know, for the component, property, time, you know, all of the six main parts, as well as um, a lot of the other information, such as, uh, you know, class, um, and lots of other metadata, each of those has a link part number. And so, for example, SARS coronavirus 2 RNA has one part number, and SARS coronavirus 2 uh, ORF1 AB region has another part number. And so, all of these part numbers and links are published uh, with the official release as a separate artifact. And so, you know, there's one uh, file that contains all the parts, and then one file that actually contains the relationship between all the terms and the parts. Um, and so this, all of this information will be included um, in the June release. Um, the link multi-axial hierarchy. So um, again, most of you are probably familiar with this, but it's basically, it's a hierarchy of terms. And currently it's uh, based on mainly the class, the component and the system for each term. And all of these individual hierarchies for the component and the system and the class, they're all manually maintained uh, by the blank content team. And so, you know, they're not perfect and we do our best, but if you see errors, you know, you can always let us know and we'll fix them. Um, but that information together is combined into a hierarchy for every link term. And that's provided as um, also a separate artifact from the link website. And in Realma, um, it's also available as are the individual class component and system hierarchies. And so in the June release, um, all of the new terms will be organized according to the, you know, the component parts. And I just showed, I just put together a little mock-up here. So, you know, we'll have SARS corona, sorry, SARS related coronavirus up here at the top. And then of course there's SARS related coronavirus RNA, which goes underneath. But then you have the separate SARS coronavirus and SARS coronavirus 2. And then you can see how underneath 2, we're going to have you know, antibodies, antigen, and RNA. And then this underneath there. And I don't have everything listed. So um, this isn't complete by any means. But uh, just to give you a general sense of how the component tree will look. And then in the actual multi axial hierarchy, you'll have the specific link terms listed underneath uh, each of these components, um, or actually component and system combinations. Um, okay, so let's see. And then link groups. So link groups are um, something that we've been working on for a few years now, and they're basically sets of link terms that could be used for various purposes and be either considered equivalent or be used um, you know, in special context. And so different use cases include, you know, maybe aggregating blood pressures, let's say, for a flow sheet or aggregating other lab data for a flow sheet or identifying all link terms that are related to a particular analyte or a concept um, for either research or quality measure reporting or other uses. And when I say particular analyte or concept, so you can imagine um, you know, one value set or one group for uh, grouping together all SARS-CoV-2 terms. Um, so that, you know, so that would be one use or one concept or analyte. Uh, but we also have groups for things like, you know, social determinants of health or, um, you know, exercise or, um, you know, other more 
not necessarily ambiguous concepts, but concepts that are not represented by one or just a handful of length components. And so, um, you know, if so, if you're looking for all length terms related to food insecurity, for example, um, we have a length group for that because it's really hard to search for all individual terms um, just based on, you know, the general surfing. And so with each new release, um, new terms that meet the criteria for a particular group like that's already existing are automatically added to that group. Or if it's a new analyte, like this will be, then uh, new groups are created. And so all that to say that, um, you know, all of these SARS-CoV-2 terms will be included in at least one group and more likely more than one group um, in the June release. And um, again, the group file um, is available as an independent download, also as fire value sets. Um, we also have details pages for them, but they're a little bit hidden because right now there's no way to actually directly search for a group through search link. But if you go to a particular term, you'll see um, you know, one of these, this is actually a screenshot for the Zika virus group, but you'll see on a particular term page, you'll see you know, member of these groups. And then if you click on that link, it actually takes you to the group details page. And so you can see we have the Zika virus uh, group and it includes you know, all of our Zika virus terms basically. And it's, uh, you know, there's many more than this, but it's, um, I didn't wanna include them all in the screenshot. And then there's a, you know, a link to um, basically the fire request for this particular group. So most likely we will have a one group for overall for all of the SARS-CoV related terms, regardless of the specific analyte, whether it's RNA or particular gene, um, and then also regardless of the specimen. And then we'll probably also have individual groups by system and then also by specific component. Um, so you can watch out for those also um, in the June release. And then finally, um, in June, the code system resource will have all of the uh, link stars, Kobe terms, parts, and answer lists. And I wrote, or I put if applicable for answer lists, just because so far, all of the terms that have answer lists are just using, um, you know, fairly generic answer lists like detected, not detected, or, you know, things that we already had before. So there, there may not be any new answer lists related to stars, Kobe terms. Um, and then we also plan to provide a value set of um, the SARS-CoV-2 blank terms in addition to the usual group content, but most likely the SARS-CoV-2 value set will just point to the appropriate group. So we're not, you know, we're not gonna have, we're not gonna create two things that are the same, we'll just have one point to either. Um, and then I just want to point out that our website has tons of resources um, and I just have a few, you know, screenshots and links to a few different ones. So there's link.org. We have, uh, you know, the fire terminology server, lots of information about that, link.org slash fire. Um, download specific information. So we have, you know, a big package that has Loink and Realma and all the accessory files. And then we also have individual downloads for different things. And so you can get information about all that on Loink.org slash downloads. Um, and then this one is um, actually, it's uh, another effort that we're working on uh, for FDA. It's basically implementation guides to areas of um, lab mapping. And so, you know, if you're interested in those, and so far we basically have one published and then two are in draft uh, draft form. And so if you're interested in that, you can go to loan.org slash guide. But anyway, basically we have lots of information and lots of free resources um, that you could take advantage of. And we're actually working currently on revamping our um, the loan knowledge base to make it more easy uh, to find information that you're looking for. And so with that, I think that was my last, yes, that was my last slide. Um, and so I think we might be a little bit ahead of schedule. Um, and Ricky Merrick was um, up next, but is she, is she on, has she joined yet? I know she- I'm here. Oh, awesome, okay. So Ricky, can we go ahead and switch over to you then? Um, we can, and I, I noticed that people were, I had said the link to the encoding guidelines is broken, so um, I sent a note out. Oh, um, so hopefully okay. we'll fix it soon. Awesome, thank you. I don't know what happened. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so can you guys see my screen? Yes, thank you. All right, so 
I'm going to talk a little bit about APHL's informatics response to the COVID-19 uh, situation. Um, thank you uh, for having me. I'm the lead terminologist at the Association of Public Health Laboratories. I've been working in um, health data exchange, specifically laboratory uh, data to public health for over 15 years, and most of those with APHL. Um, starting on the project that we used to expand to support this um, uh, response. So I'm going to give you an overview. I'm going to give you the response timeline. Um, talk about how we worked with um, getting the loinks for the CDC essay and then talk about the implementation uh, from public health labs to reporting the COVID-19 results. Um, so this next slide, I'm just going to leave here for a second so you guys can kind of look at it. Uh, January 30th, um, we started talking <laughs> about needing a CDC test and getting loin codes for it. And uh, the next day, we basically had the loin codes we needed for the CDC test. Um, and then we started working on um, helping the labs create their HL7 messages um, to distribute the loin codes. So by March 26, we've got 57 completed um, validations and sending production data from 57 jurisdictions and two more are in the process of validation. So it's been a whirlwind and my team has been amazing and I'm very grateful for that. So um, big hats off to my team. Um, so longs for the CDC essay, we got um, a sneak peek at the EUA documentation to understand the proposed results. We worked with the uh, um, CDC on that. And uh, if you guys are familiar with the CDC assay, they have two targets and then a, a conclusion. And similar to the influenza assay, CDC allows both the reporting of just the targets or the reporting of just a conclusion or the reporting of either one as a combination. And so we um, worked with them on uh, making sure we have the right codes. For conclusion reporting, we actually use a different um, order code as for the panel, um, just because a lot of labs, if they do, if they are conclusion reporters, they have those really tightly coupled and, and can't um, use a different order code than a resulted test code. Um, and it took us a little bit of discussions to talk about why we um, use the XXX, the unspecified specimen, as a system. And that was because CDC early on has said, while you know the EUA is for respiratory samples exclusively, um, there is an expectation that public health labs at some point may be in the situation that they do have to test for non-respiratory samples like stool, blood, and urine. And uh, so they felt it was important to make sure that uh, the system is unspecified in the line codes used for this. And then, of course, we were so fast getting the loin codes that we had to change the virus name because, you know, people like to update and rename the, the, the bugs that um, fail us. So how did we go about uh, implementing it in this um, time frame that we had? Well, we have a project called the Public Health Laboratory Interoperability Project, or FLIP for short. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history, the existing connections, and all the things we could reuse uh, for it. Otherwise, this would not have been possible to get it done pretty fast. So um, FLIP is basically the goals are to harmonize the vocabulary for the laboratory tests and results around influenza and respiratory virus uh, reporting to the CDC from the public health laboratories. And it, it is reporting all testing. So not just the positives, but the positives, the negatives, and for the labs that can report it, even the ones that are, um, they, they had answered satisfactory uh, samples, though CDC takes those out. Um, and so we want to utilize interoperable and reusable components. And one of the things we did was we started in 2006 writing our own guide for this project using 231 um, HL7 underlying. Um, we did already use Loink and SNOMED and UCOM in, in that gu guide. But when ELR, um, our one came out as 251 guide, we, we quickly migrated over to that. So we have several labs that are reporting 231 and we have are in the process of um, updating um, a lot of our lab feeds to using 251 data. And then I think you're all familiar with uh, additional epi data. Um, you know, people might wanna know whether the patient was hospitalized so that they can gauge the clinical impact. 
Um, they may want to know whether they traveled or whether they ha um, have specific symptoms. So some of these some of these epi data are in, epi data are included in the flip feed. So when it it flows from the public health lab via um, AIMS, the APHL Informatics Messaging Services, um, through CDC. So what is AIMS? AIMS is uh, the National Resource for Interoperability. It's a started as a Ratmut Read Hub. Think of it as a post office. You you know you label your your envelope where it doesn't need to go, and and AIMS routes uh, according to what's on the envelope. And so rather than having to have you know multiple connections uh, between the states, they can all send to AIMS and then they can send to each other. So um, we started it with FLIP for influenza reporting to CDC, but it's expanded to include um, electronic lab reporting to several jurisdictions from Quest and, and um, PAML. And we have, um, it, it houses the um, reportable condition knowledge management system for electronic case reporting. And mm -hmm. it's, it's a pretty big thing. But with that, we have existing conditions, uh, connections to all these public health labs. So this is what FLIP was at the beginning of this year when we needed to expand. So um, we got, we have uh, 30 labs that we're sending 251 uh, data and we've got, you know, some, the rest of them uh, sending 231. Uh, you'll notice uh, there's only one, two jurisdictions that are not really engaged in this at, at the moment. Every, all the other jurisdictions are um, working on, are, are using FLIP and, and are using HL7 messaging. So, um, if, in order to get FLIP um, off and running, we created the technical assistance process. Um, and so uh, the technical assistance we provide is help with the mapping, help with the route implementation and the actual setup, um, help create HL7 sample messages. Um, and then we have a, a whole validation suite that they have to work through first um, via email to us. And then um, they're sending it over the actual connection to a staging environment so that CDC can, can see the data and understand it. And then uh, for a while, they'll be in parallel production um, before they go to full production. We use a mix of um, means to do that. We usually have weekly calls with the jurisdictions and most of the time we try for virtual support, but sometimes an on-site site visit is, is required to get this stuff done. Um, so vocabulary mapping, we created the um, encoding guidelines and basically what that focuses on is the vocabulary around the order codes in OBR4, the resulted test codes in OBX3 and the um, results in OBX5. And obviously for some of the epi questions, for examples, or for some of the lab tests, those could be numeric or they could be dates or they could be identifiers. Um, but for most of them, uh, they will be Code it, and so we we create a pretty we have pretty strict rules about what order codes can be used with with what um, uh, resulted test codes and what the value set is for each of these. So, um, for example, you see the value set name is listed over here for each, for this combination, and then you can expand and actually look what's in what's in the value set in these encoding guidelines. Um, and then we have the NIST tooling. We, we use the um, NIST tools to create a FLIP specific profile where you can use the context uh, free validation to test your test messages in. Um, it's pretty, it works the same way as, as the ELR NIST tool if you're familiar with that. If not, happy to uh, give, a, give a seminar on or you know something on that, but um, I'm sure there's um, know about that. So we have it uh, tailored to include the vocabulary checking uh, for our, based on our encoding guidelines that's included in, in the NIST tool, which you wouldn't get if you're using the ELR tool. And then we have, as I said, specific message scenarios that they need to identify whether or not these tests apply to their jurisdictions. And if, if they do, then they have to create um, these test messages and they send them to us and then we send them feedback back. And usually it takes a couple of rounds um, till all the messages for all the scenarios are clean. So we had all of these specific things um, already in place. And so it was pretty easy to take the, the encoding guidelines and expand it and add on the um, rules around the CDC test for COVID-19 testing. 
and this link evidently is broken, so we'll, we'll get it fixed, but you can all get the access to um, this here. Um, in the process, of course, the public health labs had questions. And so just like uh, Regan Streif has the SARS-CoV uh, FAQ page, we created um, an FAQ for specifically mapping um, the CDC test kits. And this one was specifically around, you know, what happens because they renamed it. Um, and then we use the TA model for implementation assistance. So we've created some test message, me messages for them to uh, work with, and we've created some test scenarios that they have to implement. So I'm just gonna give you some numbers. My um, tech guy just sent me these this morning. So um, as of, these are numbers uh, through for FLIP reporting, so this is influenza reporting and, and any respiratory uh, virus related reporting, all positives and negatives since October 2017. And you can kind of see the, you know, flu season bumps along there in, in red is the total um, for 231 and 251. So this shows you uh, the different um, data streams. And then this one is the total numbers. Um, over the different years, focusing on January, February, and March, you can see how much uh, traffic has increased in just March since we started um, onboarding the COVID-19 testing. So what are we going to try to do? Well, as uh, Swapna pointed out, there's new tests every day, and uh, more LOIC guidance is needed globally, and that's we leave that up to LOIC, um, but we'll cover the public health lab angle of things and uh, more validation will be needed for our labs when they start um, onboarding some of these commercial tests. And so, because, and hopefully we have a little bit of a breather, um, we're working on using the NIST tooling to create context-based validation so that um, the labs can actually use uh, this tool and do the validation without having to um, send them to us and us having to you know, manually look at them. Um, and as you can see, we've, we've started building this out for the conclusion reporters. It's, it's the easiest um, work and we're gonna set it up for each of the different commercial labs, lab tests kits, um, because some of the value sets are different. And so we've, mm -hmm. we've currently built the CDC assay because that's in production. Um, and we know that uh, some of the, and the New York state assay, and, and we know that some of the other commercial lab tests um, will be used um, in our labs. So what they can do is then they can pick whichever test kit they're um, currently trying to validate, in this case, the CDC assay, and they can um, run, load the test step and uh, run through each of the scenarios and they will get a report whether it's, you know, that it passed or didn't pass. So um, I really couldn't do it without my team and um, yeah, hats off to them. If you have any questions, that's my email. Ricky, thank you so much. That was incredibly educational and thanks for helping us with that link. Uh, next up should be Tracy from ONC. Tracy, I think you're on the line. If you are, we don't hear you. So it looks like she's on, but maybe unmuted. I mean, sorry, muted. Hi, can you hear me now? Oh, oh yes. Yeah. Hi. Hi, Tracy. There we go. Hi. All right. All right. Can you see my screen? Yes. Thank you. All right, so thank you for having me. Good afternoon. My name is Tracy Okubo, and I'm with the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT. Um, I sit in the Office of Technology within the Standards Division in the Infrastructure and Innovation Branch, but I also split part of my time with the Chief Scientist Division. It's a lot of crossover work um, that we do in terms of standards and research. And, very happy to support the Regan Street Institute on their work with uh, LOIC. So, 
ONC's mission very quickly is to improve the health and well-being of individuals and communities throughout the youth through the use of technology and health information that is accessible when and where it matters most. And I apologize about the birds in the background. Or there's the perks of working at home. Uh, so I'm actually gonna give just a brief background on our enhancing the logical observation, identifiers, names, and codes, or LOINC standards to support US interoperability. In 2018, we actually awarded a cooperative agreement to Regan Street Institute uh, for a five-year period of performance with an initial amount award of 600,000. Um, since, since that time, we've provided a supplemental award in FY19 and are in the process of issuing an additional supplemental award for fiscal year 20. Uh, the key objectives for this cooperative agreement was twofold. First of all, updating the technical infrastructure to allow um, for expedited improvements to access content, as well as to help bridge the gap between LOINC and HL7 FIRE. The second objective was to help advance the deployment of FIRE-based terminology services for LOINC and to support the LOINC, support the LOINC content developers as they develop new content to support the USCDI. Um, finally, also to update tools to support RELMA. A key accomplishment to date within the first year, uh, hopefully you guys have seen and benefited from a lot of these accomplishments, upgrading the server uh, to host the Fire API services, upgrading and deploying the latest versions of the LHC forms and link panel contents, uh, converting from the legacy-based process to the new multi-set SQL server, um, both testing and deploying it, and deploying the latest link release 2.65 in December. 2019 was very busy in terms of continuing on the upgrade, upgrades and deployments. Um, there were a number of new link codes that were developed and released. Um, and some of the redesign of the LOINC pages and editing forms with the goal of making uh, the LOINC website and content much more user-friendly. And in um, June, there was the release of the 2.66, which included the new set of consumer-friendly LOINC terms and new fire value sets. So um, one of the required deliverables under this cooperative agreement is to do an annual environmental scan. And many of you probably received the request to participate in the survey. So those results and findings all went into the environmental scan that was submitted to ONC, which helped us to prioritize the focus for the new youth. Um, we had recently met and gone over the environmental scan and had decided these would be the priority focuses for this year. Um, obviously, the SARS-CoV-2 COVID-19 response, um, very happy that we've been able to help put Regan Street in a position to rapidly create and respond to the COVID test kit response um, requests from CDC, WHO, and other countries. Um, that is the number one priority, obviously, as is response for everybody, I guess, at this time. Um, the other priorities, once the COVID response hopefully starts to calm down, would be to focus on web page enhancement, so to continue to increase searchability and make user-friendly updates to the link web page. Increase education and outreach to help promote more awareness of LOINC uh, contents and resources. And uh, to continue to support and update LOINC content um, to expand for the Firebase API implementation, as well as any of the new data classes and elements that are identified in the ONC USCDI. Um, 
along the lines of supporting what Regan Street has done um, in response to the pre-release page um, and the work that Regan Street has been doing in response to COVID-19, we have actually created a new page on our interoperability standards advisory uh, called Interoperability for COVID-19 Novel Coronavirus Pandemic, where we've listed a number of the different resources, including LOINC, SNOMEDS, ICD-10, and CPT, and HIPPIC. Um, to help uh, collect, uh, collect all of the resources into one site where we know this will help advance for interoperability. And we've also created a tools and resource page for the health IT community, uh, for health IT developers and others, care providers, et cetera, in the community. So um, I promise it would be very short and sweet. I know that you folks are taking questions through the chat box, but you could also email directly um, Tracy, T-R-A-C-Y dot Okubo, O-K-U-B-O at hhs.gov. Thank you so much. For yeah. Thank you. I, you know, I actually love hearing the birds in the background. It's awesome. <laughs> So thank you for taking the time to do that today. And thank you for your ongoing support of the work that we do. It's really made quite a difference. Um, next up would be Jim Case with SNOMED. And Jim, I'm pretty sure you're on the line. And hopefully you can just grab the share button. And I will. Hold on just a second. Great. Um, before you start, I do want to echo what Swapna said before. We are in the process of working closely with SNOMED to update our collaborative agreement, and we're very appreciative of the work we've been able to do with them. And I'll turn it over to you, Jim. Well, thank you, everybody. Can you see my screen? Yes, oh, sorry. Great, okay. Uh, hello. Um, first of all, uh, I wanna thank Swapna and Jamie for going through the terminology development process. Uh, there's, there are a lot of similarities between the terminology development process within SNOMED and the terminology process as, as was described by Swapna and Jamie. And so that actually saves a lot of time in terms of uh, going through how we respond internally to requests for content. So uh, just to introduce, my, introduce myself, my name is Jim Case. I'm the, currently the head of terminology for Snowman International. Uh, I have been working in the terminology and standards area for about 30 years. Um, and the primary responsibility I have is to set editorial policy for Snowman International, which is a comprehensive uh, clinical terminology of around 350,000 concepts that include clinical findings, uh, healthcare procedures, uh, standardization of uh, organism names, uh, specimen types, and a variety of different, uh, different aspects of healthcare. I also want to acknowledge Andrew Atkinson, who is our terminology release manager, and he has had to respond uh, much more rapidly to this uh, emerging crisis, uh, even than the content team that I have uh, within Snowman International in terms of going through the, um, the quality assurance release of content uh, in an expedited way. Uh, I think Jamie mentioned that there is a, a fair amount of um, quality assurance that's required for each release. Uh, we have the same, the same requirements. And so the timing of this uh, really put a, a, uh, a stress on the internal technical team. And, and so I definitely want to acknowledge the work that Andrew has done. So uh, the initial SNOMED response to this uh, began, as, uh, as was mentioned before, with some initial actions being taken in late January 2020. SNOMED was contacted by several affiliates for content related to novel coronavirus. And we actually received an email from Jamie uh, asking how SNOMED was going to be responding to this uh, as well. Now the desire was for the content to be included in the January 2020 international release of SNOMED International. The challenge for us is that this was one week prior to the official release 
that we have uh, on January 31st and was nearly two months after the official close of editing. And so we had not had to respond to the need for content to be included in an official release uh, barely a week before our normal release process uh, had to go on. And this is where Andrew's work was, was so critical that internally we worked with the content team and we worked with the technical team to be able to add the disease-related and organism-related content for COVID-19. Um, and then they worked over the weekend to run through the entire quality assurance and release process that would normally be done over a period of one to two weeks. So the initial set of terms that we released related to both the virus and the disease uh, were created and quality assured by our content team and we actually only needed to add at this point seven concepts to the January 2020 release. And as was mentioned before, the naming was very dynamic and our naming at the time that this was added was based on the current knowledge and the current names of the viruses and the diseases that were out there. So essentially the disease was named, um, was named 2019 NCOV and Wuhan coronavirus was the name of the organism at that point. So the entire release process was rerun and our international edition was actually released on schedule on January 31st, 2020. And again, as has been mentioned, these are rapidly changing circumstances. Just a few days after our formal release on February 11th, the WHO renamed the disease COVID-19. And also on February 11th, the WHO emphasized guidelines to remove any references to geographic regions, persons, or nationalities from name disorders. Likewise, on March 2nd, the Coronavirus Study Group, as was uh, mentioned early in the, in the uh, presentations today, the study group of the International Committee on Taxonomy of Viruses published a consensus statement naming the virus Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Related Virus 2 or SARS-CoV-2. So they, the urgency in renaming this so that people would be using the accurate terminology required us to do content changes to the Snowman International content. And it was done in order to adhere to this guidance. And then we began an internal discussion on how were we gonna get this new terminology out there. We do not uh, like Loink, have a pre-release page where content that is uh, going to appear in the next release um, is detailed in any way. And for many of the reasons that were outlined earlier is that until there's an official release, there's always an opportunity for change and sometimes not only the terming related to a concept identifier, but also the concept identifier itself could change. And so because of that, we typically do not release uh, interim content. So we had a, a number of internal discussions on what was the best way to actually release this content. And so it was decided by SNOMED leadership that because of the urgency uh, of this and the growing urgency of the pandemic, that we needed up-to-date up content available in a formal way uh, to the user community. And so that warranted a special release of SNOMED. So some of the content refinements that were made was uh, the improvement of the COVID-19 descriptions to align with all of the international naming standards and the supporting components. The content was quickly reviewed and quality assured by our senior terminologists. And then our mappings to, um, to ICD were reviewed in line with the SNOMED content. Following that, there were multiple iterations of discussions within our uh, terminology research advisory group and our user community in order to agree on how this interim release package would actually be made available and how we were going to be able to communicate this to our user community in order to support all the end users. The relevant governance bodies of SNOMED International, our general assembly, our member forum and our management board were all made aware with opportunities for them to feedback on what our internal decisions had been, our internal plans, I should say. And then planning was carried out 
to migrate to continuous delivery in mind. We are internally discussing now how to make content uh, that is needed urgently more, um, more available. And so we are moving towards, instead of a uh, biannual release process, we're moving towards a process to actually go through continuous delivery. Following uh, all these internal discussions, uh, we went through the technical build, uh, quality assurance and distribution process, uh, updated our content, packaged it into an agreed form, and then tested all of this using a number of our automated processes. So during this process, our communications lead was preparing documents to communicate the response of SNOMED to the needs for these uh, new codes. Communications were uh, drafted, sent in advance, and then, and then published on the web. So following the, the formal March 19th, I, I forgot to add that, that a formal release or an interim release of SNOMED, the entire SNOMED package was released on March 9th that included all of the updated content to the COVID-19 uh, and other, uh, other content within SNOMED, which was an out of release cycle for us. On February 13th, we issued a joint statement with LOINC and SNOMED stating our, uh, our efforts to provide standardized terminology for COVID. And then we created a number of web pages in, in order to provide ready access to these new codes without having to go through the entire integration of the, of the formal release. So a special web page was created to provide this access to the SNOMED terms. And in order to make the terms more generally available, we added the COVID-19 content to the Snowden International Global Patient Set. The International Global Patient Set is a set of concept identifiers, fully specified names, and preferred descriptions that are available free for use internationally um, by, by anyone, as opposed to our current um, our current way of providing SNOMED, which is through affiliate licenses or national licenses. So this made the content available for immediate use, and it can be used under the same open license as the Global Patient Set, which is a Creative Commons uh, attribution uh, license. And th all of these terms will be formally published in the updated Global Patient Set uh, in 2020. And that is just a, a quick response to our, to our uh, or a quick discussion of, of our response. We continue to get new requests in for additional COVID terms, and those are being reviewed and are planned to be released in the July 2020 release of SNOMED. We are not at this time planning on a, another interim release for many of the same reasons that was discussed regarding LOINC. Whether or not we decide to pre-release these is going to be based on urgency from our member community uh, asking for these terms and then being able to provide them in a, in a rapid fashion. Well, so with thank that, yeah, go ahead. I was just gonna say thank you. And if there are any additional questions, uh, I can be reached at the, uh, at the email address on the slide. And once again, we will be making all the slides available and we are recording the webinar so people will be able to download and listen and please share with other people. Thanks so much, Jim. Next, we have up um, Dr. Stan Huff, who most of you know from Intermountain and he's gonna share with us the current situation at Intermountain as well as how they're using their LOINC codes. So Stan, we'll turn it over to you. <laughs> okay, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, it's fine. perfect. Great, okay, and I'll share my screen. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you for this opportunity to talk and I'm, it's 
uh, I'm going to go through uh, just sort of what's what's happening on the front lines, but recognizing that I'm not I'm not the front line uh, information systems person at Intermountain. That that uh, a whole set of people that are behind the scenes creating all of the things that you're going to see. And I would I would point out particularly uh, Diego is Ludlow. Uh, who's our chief health information officer, uh, Seraphine Kapsendoy, who's uh, the chief clinical uh, informatics folks, and uh, Craig Jacobson and his team who, who do all of the actual development. Um, so I'll just jump in, uh, and I'm going to do sort of uh, a uh, combined uh, presentation of, of things that are um, of live of live websites and so this is the this is the Utah State coronavirus uh, opening page and then uh, there are a lot of you know sort of very current information that they put on this front page uh, but then there's a dashboard uh, where you can go and look at uh, what's happening basically real time because this gets updated uh, multiple times a day. And so uh, in Utah right now, uh, we have 346 cases, uh, people who have been tested positive. Unfortunately, we've had one death, uh, but we've tested 6,837 people. And, uh, and you can see a heat map of where, uh, you know, where the cases are. And, and it would probably be more meaningful too if if you uh, if we scaled these based on the population that that they're looking at. So obviously the the most people in Utah <laughs> live around Salt Lake, uh, and so it's not surprising that Salt Lake has the greatest number of cases. And you know some of these other places um, you know have have much smaller uh, smaller populations. But it's interesting, uh, the two biggest, Salt Lake, obviously, because of the population, Summit County is where all the ski resorts are and, and sort of um, those areas were seeded by a lot of people who are traveling in and out of state to come and ski here, which we love, but was not, you know, not great for the, for the COVID virus spread. Uh, so, so that's uh, sort of what's going on at the state level. And then this, uh, uh, this chart shows uh, something interesting, uh, and and I'll uh, I'll show more about it. Uh, th these are basically positive cases, uh, and in in visitors or people who are uh, in residents of Utah, and and you see this really big spike, uh, you know, a few days ago, uh, and you see that. Again, you know, this is showing positive cases. This is showing uh, uh, everybody tested, basically, and um, the number who tested positive. And there, you know, there's a spike here as well that corresponds to this spike over over in the uh, the other part. Uh, so the um, let me go back to my uh, slide set here for a second. Um, the well, no, I won't. I come, I'll come here. Um, one of the things that we're doing, uh, and, and one of the key parts of the strategy for Intermountain has been uh, screening people, and and one of our concerns is that we would have we would be overwhelmed in our emergency rooms and in our uh, Instacare centers and other places by people who were wanting to be tested or had symptoms. And we wouldn't be able to evaluate them uh, quickly enough. And so, on Intermountain's uh, homepage, uh, we have this new symptom checker where people can come, and uh, it's a it's an AI-driven uh, sort of thing. And uh, you can, you know, you can basically learn about uh, the disease. Uh, and, and there's educational material, or you can go in and say, check me for it. 
uh, and then it starts asking questions and I won't go through the whole thing. Uh, but, you know, it, it asks you, you know, kind of the obvious questions. Have you, have you been, you know, have you traveled anywhere? Uh, uh, have you been around somebody who traveled? And we'll just, I'm making up answers here. Uh, and they'll say, I don't know anybody there. Uh, have you told health officials? And I won't go through the rest of this just based on time, but, you know, it'll, it, it goes on to ask if you, do you have a fever? Do you have cough? Uh, uh, you know, do you have fatigue or, uh, you know, typical uh, muscle aches and pains and, and that sort of stuff. And in the background, it's creating the probability uh, of things. And at the end, basically, it says, uh, you know, uh, you have a low probability, just continue to watch. And if things change, uh, come back again. If it's positive, what it does is refers people to uh, our hotline. And what and, and when they call the hotline, what happens is that uh, a virtual visit is set up uh, and it could be just a phone call or it could be a, uh, a FaceTime or actually even a WebEx session so that uh, a clinician can talk with the patient and, and, and find out exactly what they're doing. And then if they are at a high risk of, uh, of having the disease, then they're referred to one of uh, of I, I, about 20 collection sites where people just drive up and, uh, and, and provide a sample and don't even get out of their cars uh, because we don't want, you know, anybody coming uh, to a clinic or to the emergency room who's infected and then would affect, uh, infect other patients and or healthcare workers. And so, it it really is is being done as you know it as a very much an a outpatient and ambulatory sort of uh, approach. Uh, I come back to my slides here for a second now. Um, so come down here. Um, so uh, again, what we're doing is. Uh, with ambulatory testing, uh, every patient needs to be assessed before they they uh, before they're tested, uh, and we only want to see the patients who are being tested that meet requirements that are on our uh, on our screening instrument. Uh, a test gets ordered, and then uh, a patient gets sent to an actual testing center or to a, to one of the the drive up. Uh, collection spots and uh, and we collect the specimen and then they do the testing. Uh, so in general, and just to say about the, the general environment in Utah, uh, we're sort of, uh, pract not sort of, we're practicing social distancing. Uh, everybody who can is working from home. Uh, there are uh, no uh, public meetings of, uh, involving more than 10 people. And, uh, you know, they're in terms of the, the healthcare, uh, we've, we're doing obviously providing, uh, the normal kinds of care, uh, and, and certainly emergency kind of care at all of our hospitals and clinics, but we've, uh, canceled all elective surgeries and procedures uh, until further notice. And all scheduled clinic visits are being done by phone or FaceTime. Uh, as, as luck would have it, uh, the old guy that I am, I've had two clinic visits, one follow-up on my uh, prostate cancer and another one just a routine follow-up on my with my internal medicine doc, uh, both of which have been done over the phone. So they... <laughs> They, they, they call and make sure that I'm going to be there and make sure that I don't have something where they need to examine me or something else. You know, both of my visits basically just talking about lab tests and whether I have any new symptoms and what they're going to order next and if I need to come in for a blood draw or, or that kind of stuff. 
but that's going on everywhere in Inner Mountain. So, uh, I mean, you you know, the the parking lots and other things are really, you know, uh, very little traffic uh, in and out of uh, our clinics, uh, outpatient, Instacares, those kind of places, because they're, they're really trying to minimize um, all of the uh, contact, uh, you know, any patient to patient contact or any contact between patients and uh, healthcare workers that would lead to healthcare workers getting infected. Now, uh, as I go back, uh, the other thing that, that I think is, is really pretty interesting is um, our operations uh, website. And so this is, this is a dashboard that was set up specifically for uh, Intermountain and Intermountain managers to track and understand what's happening. Uh, this opening page, you know, gives uh, the surveillance, and these are numbers now that are that are just directly for uh, Intermountain. Uh, we have 177 people uh, that uh, have tested positive. This is the number of people tested by Intermountain: one indeterminate test uh, and seven equivocal tests. Now, one of the interesting things you you go back, uh, you remember that first. Uh, on the state website where it was showing um, the um, that that big spike and you can see the big spike here as well uh, the the interesting thing or or the thing that maybe was not obvious before until about uh, four days ago uh, or, or maybe five days ago we didn't have enough uh, there, there were not enough testing reagents and test kits available to test everybody that we would like to have test. And that was true, not of just Intermountain, but of the state. And so uh, what was happening is that, uh, you know, we're collecting samples from anybody that was at a high risk, but some of the samples were either refrigerated or stored and they prioritized the samples based on, on highest risk and most important information. And we did that testing uh, with the number of test kits that we had. And then the good thing uh, that happened is uh, about four days ago, uh, we got, uh, you know, uh, the sort of the supply chain part of this kicked in and we got a, a lot of test kits. And over, over the weekend, they were able to test everybody and to test our backlog. And so you can see, I mean, if you're just looking at the number of cases, it would look like that. Uh, we had this exponential rise in cases, you know, four days ago. But what actually happened, uh, the, you know, we, we've had, you know, continuing uh, numbers of cases uh, and, and positive cases, but it's actually been not so exponential uh, because what made it look exponential is that we tested, you know, uh, like three or four times as many people over the weekend as we'd been able to test before on any, any previous day. And so you see uh, that, in fact, you know, the, the, uh, there, there's still uh, things bumping up and down, but, um, you know, the, the cases are starting, uh, well, there, there's not like a doubling of positive cases every day. Uh, it's, it's in the, you know, we're down to where we have, uh, as you can see, you know, 19, 15, 33 cases, et cetera, uh, as, as, as we're going along. So, uh, so that tells, you know, that that's kind of helpful to know when you're interpreting things. Now, some other things that you'll see up, up here in, in the dashboard, uh, you know, all kinds of kind of interesting things like occupancy of our hospitals and other things. But one of the, one of the key things, and I, I don't want to take too much time is, uh, you know, one of the chief concerns is that we would not have enough hospital beds for one thing. And the second thing would be that we don't have enough ventilators uh, for people who are in, 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 in actual distress. And so I'll click on this ventilator usage uh, spreadsheet. And what you can see is down the left-hand side, you can see all of Intermountain's hospitals and you can see, uh, you know, the, the hospitals are of, of different sizes and different uh, acuities. And you can see down the side, you can see, uh, you know, this hospital has three ventilators and we're not using them. This has six and we're not using them. This one has three and we're not using them. 
you know, in Dixie Regional, we've got uh, 28 ventilators and seven are in use. So, you know, we have the ability basically to, uh, if, if we start getting uh, uh, a really big collection of people who need to be hospitalized, uh, we'll be able to know, you know, where, where uh, people are, uh, which hospitals to send people to that have open ventilators and open beds, uh, all of that kind of thing. Uh, and so uh, there's similar, you know, kinds of things. I won't, I won't show all of these, but to show the number of encounters, uh, you know, the, the number of people who are coming to our emergency department, uh, supply levels for uh, masks and personal protective equipment, you know, all of those kind of things. And this is, you know, this is, is to me, I, I mean, I'm amazed that, uh, uh, our information systems team has been able to put such a useful and practical, um, you know, dashboard into place in in uh, in Inner Mountain. And again, that's all other people, not me, uh, that that have done that. Uh, so uh, coming back then, uh, you know, some other impacts. Uh, this is uh, a uh, this is an online uh, priority for Intermountain Healthcare Development, IS Development Priorities. And I mean, you know, just to sort of scope the impact, you can see that the top nine things now are all uh, development, I, IS development projects that are re related to COVID-19. Uh, things, expansion of our scheduled video visits, community testing, uh, our virtual command center. So we have a command center, uh, and there, that's that's manned 24/7. And there are uh, command center meetings uh, twice a day. You know, looking at uh, all of the things. Uh, again, looking uh, you know software that ha relates to our ability to manage emergency department surge beds, inpatient surge be surge beds, et cetera, et cetera. You know, and this is all, as you might guess, this is all different, you know, from a few weeks ago when, uh, you know, all of the IS top priority things were improving our uh, EHR system, uh, a new patient facing digital front door thing, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so, you know, the COVID uh, response has really had, uh, you know, a, a major impact on, on Intermountain uh, IT. Uh, specifically about our testing, uh, we're uh, using uh, a reagent for 2019, you know, novel coronavirus reagent from Integrated DNA Technologies. And I, I looked to try and find if they had specified the LOINC code anywhere for that or, or not. The actual instruments that, that's used is a, an ABI 7500 fast real-time PCR system. And uh, the loin code that we're using, and, and, and Jamie sent me a note that we're, we may not be doing it right, or she didn't say that. She said, if, if you're really just testing respiratory specimens, then you should probably use the more specific one. But we're, we're doing, the, our actual reporting is done as a, as a post-coordinated. In other words, we use this, uh, this code, uh, which is the, is, is the RNA uh, uh, test, with an unspecified uh, specimen, uh, qualitative test, et cetera. And then we have a second code that, which is really the, which is the specimen source. And so we're post-coordinating. So the actual space, specimen source, whether this was sputum or uh, bronchial alveolar lavage or, you know, uh, whatever it is, uh, would be sent as a second part. So the combination of the, of the two codes, uh, you know, get, uh, give us kind of all of the information. We know the the um, the actual reagent and the test and the and the loin code for the for that test, and then we have the specimen source that that's explicit as the second part of the message. But we probably need to review that and see if we're doing it right. And I need to actually probably even ask more questions. It may be that we want to change this the code that we're using uh, to the the code that's. Uh, 
specific for um, respiratory samples. Uh, we also work very closely with AREP laboratories. And when, when uh, during the time that we were, uh, didn't have reagents and, and other things, uh, we sent a lot of tests out uh, to ARUP laboratories uh, to, do, to do testing. So our, what we actually have are a combination of tests that we did directly at Intermountain and tests that we sent out to ARUP and then, and then, and then those results came back. So uh, that's going on. I guess one other thing that I would say is that the last I knew, and I don't, I don't know the exact count, but of, of the people who are positive right now, uh, well, the last time I knew, which is probably a couple of days ago, there were, there were 10 people hospitalized uh, out of that uh, approximately 400 people who had tested positive. So, so far we haven't, you know, we've, we've been incredibly busy uh, with people visiting that online uh, screening tool. Uh, we've been incredibly busy uh, with people where we're collecting samples uh, at, at the drive up sites. Uh, but we haven't seen, you know, we're not anywhere near being swamped in terms of, uh, you know, hospital capacity or respiratory capacity or others. And we'll cross our fingers because, it, as you know, and as Sort of illustrated by unfortunate cases in 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 other places, uh, that can change rapidly. Uh, you know, if um, if circumstances change, but so far we've been we've been pretty lucky, and so we're feeling uh, very blessed that we haven't had uh, you know any any bigger trouble. Uh, so, just as a uh, an aside, uh, and, and not talking so much about COVID at all now, uh, just, just an, another couple of things that are going on. Uh, in cooperation, well, it, a grant from the FDA, uh, from Michael Waters and, and the SHIELD uh, LIVID team, uh, we've, uh, it, Intermountain's participating in a study to test, um, you know, the, uh, the LIVID uh, approach for assigning LOINC codes. And this is a diagram that I stole uh, directly from Michael Waters. But uh, for those of you who might not be familiar with, with LIVID, uh, LIVID stands for LOINC codes for in vitro uh, diagnostic tests. And, and the idea is that uh, you have a test catalog uh, and in the test catalog, uh, you have, um, you know, all of the, all of the tests that you're doing in the laboratory. And on, on the other side of this, uh, you have vendors and what vendors are doing and uh, Swapna uh, referred to this, you know, they're, and, and they have uh, references to this on, on pages that are available on the LOINC site. You have vendors who are saying, uh, you know, for our test kit uh, or for this particular instrument, measuring this analyte and in this specimen, this is the LOINC code that uh, you should use. And so the vendors are making a table and there's a, the LIVID standard is about, uh, is, a, is a spreadsheet uh, that specifies exactly how uh, you, you know, that's making the linkage between an instrument type a particular instrument and, and the channel on that instrument, if you will, and uh, an analyte and a, and a specimen type uh, for the assignment of the LOINC codes. And they make that available publicly so that in the laboratory, what people are doing then is instead of uh, sort of looking at their test catalog and trying to figure out what LOINC code uh, you should use, try and simplify the process so that they say, well, what test kit am I using? Oh, what, what, what was the LOINC code that was identified by the test kit manufacturer for that test? And that becomes the test that you map to. And we're hoping that that will lead to more consistent uh, uh, assignment of LOINC codes across the industry and make it less. And so we're actually doing an experiment. We're going to, uh, we were funded. Deloitte is the, the prime contractor on that. And, um, the um, and 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 we're gonna, we we're just starting the test now. We're going to go in and review our test catalogs. We're going to follow the livid process, 
and compare what, what the livid process would say we should be mapped to versus what we've been mapped to historically. We're gonna actually change the mappings and see what the impact then is on our systems. Uh, you know, when we change that and what we need to change in our, on, in our interfaces and other things to transmit the correct codes, uh, all of that sort of stuff. So that'll be something that, that we can report on, um, you know, hopefully within uh, uh, the next six months or so. So we're excited about that. The last thing I would say, and uh, it's good that you were running a little ahead of time, so I don't, uh, I'll get us back on time here. Uh, the, uh, another thing that we're doing, and this is really Susan Matney that many of you would know, and uh, Nathan Davis and Joey Coyle and Ning Zhao and, and some others. And then in cooperation with information that we've gotten from Regan Streif and from Swapna and Jamie and others, uh, uh, with uh, MITRE Corporation uh, conjunction, not, it's not an HL7 project, but with a lot of support from HL7, from Ch Chuck Jaffe and from, from Wayne Kubik, et cetera. And I'm probably gonna forget others, but uh, what we're doing is making a, a fire implementation guide for COVID-19. Uh, and that would include not only the lab testing, but you know, the clinical uh, signs and symptoms, uh, the uh, demographic information, uh, and and then some diagnostic information, et cetera. And, and we're gonna make that open and free and publish that on the, on the Logica website. So, uh, you know, if you have some interest in that, send me an email and we can connect you to a uh, thing. We, you know, it, it's gonna be growing. We're gonna do sort of the, the highest priority things first. And then as people review it and look and need other things for a particular use case, then we can add in additional fire profiles and additional information to make it possible for people to share through uh, fire APIs, uh, the COVID related information. So we're excited about that too. So that's all I had to say. I apologize for going long. Uh, thank you for being ahead so that I had time to say everything and I'll, I'll stop there. Dan, thanks so much. Uh, we actually got a lot of questions for you during your presentation. I'm not sure we can get to all of them. Um, but let's move now to, uh, so first off, I want to thank everybody that's presented up to now. Our plan is to do Q&A for about uh, 20 minutes, a little less than 20 minutes, so we can get everybody out on time. Just so you know, we have captured all the questions. If we don't get to all of them, which we will not, I can forewarn you about that. We will be answering them and make sure we're posting them online. So with that, uh, Swapna, I'm not sure who's coordinating, uh, asking the questions and answering. Um, so I think David, um, you're gonna go ahead and ask the questions, right? And maybe say who the question is for. Yes, hi Swapna. So hi, thanks. This is David Bayordo, um, I'm gonna be helping, uh, I'm on the one team, I'm gonna be helping by um, asking uh, the questions and trying to point them to the right people. Um, first of all, I'd like to start off by thanking the members of our team, uh, Brene and Sarah, who've really done a tremendous job uh, assembling the questions as they've come through and, you know, organizing them into groups so that makes this job much easier as far as figuring out what to ask. We got a lot of really interesting questions um, and we're not going to be able to answer all of them live as, you know, as Terry said, so we will, you know, make every attempt to put them on, on the website. Okay, so without further ado, I guess we'll jump right in. Um, we'll start off with one from John Snyder. Um, and here, here's the question. My understanding is that there are differences between the CDC test kit and the WHO test kits. Will there, will there be something in related names that will allow us to differentiate between the two test kits? So Swapna, I think that one might be one that you can take. Um. Yeah, sure. So, um, so I guess a couple of things. So one, um, so for the CDC, uh, there's a specific list of codes and we actually created a panel for the, you know, that represents the CDC test kit and others. Um, and we have in the term description that it was created uh, for the CDC. Um, we probably won't have that in the related names 
necessarily, but you'll be able to get to it through the term description and through, you know, through our general uh, mappings in the APHL mapping information. As for the WHO, I don't think they have a specific kit, but they just have information about different manufacturers and different assays. And so, you know, we won't really have a way to label those in the term itself, but I think just making sure that you're following the mapping principles, Jimmy outlined and just, you know, making sure that you're, you have the code with the correct component and SMN and, you know, whether it's qualitative or quantitative, um, you know, I, I think there'll be lots of assays that are posted that will have the same link code. Um, and we've seen a lot of manufacturers test it, that will share the same link code for the overall results. So, um, so I guess to answer your, you know, to answer your question, we have some information specific to the test kit, but we won't really be including that in the uh, related names. Okay, great. So the next, you know, sort of is a group of questions related to the first question um, involving information and names available on the pre-release page for terms. And, you know, these came from a number of people, um, Wojciech, uh, Nathan Davis, but I'll, I'll just mention, I'll just kind of read a couple of them and then we can get the sort of general theme and I think we can kind of answer in a general way about what's available on the pre-release page now um, and, you know, what we're planning. I, I know that, uh, you know, people have been, as the questions have come in, have been a little bit prescient and predicting what <laughs> upcoming speakers were about to explain. So some of these are going to be questions that have been answered in subsequent talks, but I think the fact that people thought of asking them, um, you know, up front means they sh they could be reiterated again. So, first one is the proper names are important. However, Loink can use synonyms to guide Loink users to the right code. For a test with proper long name, having a synonym term also leads to it would help adoption. Okay, well that sort of relates to the first one. Another question is, so far, all that has been published online for the SARS-CoV link codes are the fully specified names. Is there a resource that contains all of the different names for these, i.e. long common name, short name, etc.? So I guess we can go ahead and, and you know, you know, kind of answer that question again and then cl clarify what we're planning to do to update the current details page for the pre-release terms. Sure. So, um, so this is Swapna again. So, we include you know related names, some of which are synonyms for exactly that reason. Because you know we have the formal name and then long common name and short name. But sometimes, um, like COVID nineteen, is not going to be a part of any of those names. Uh, but we will include it as a related name. Sees. Uh, couldn't find the term. So um, yeah, we try to do that as much as possible. And I know that right now, the only information available is a fully specified name, which is basically the six major parts um, on the details page. And um, I think I mentioned in, my, in one of my talks that we are working on expanding what's included on those details pages to include term descriptions that will have some of the uh, test kit or, you know, analyte specific information as well as answer lists and um, and the related names, which will include synonyms as well. So that's not available right now, but it will be uh, probably next week. Okay, great. Um, thanks, Wapna. And uh, a follow-up to that one was uh, a request for a, uh, a CSV download option for the pre-release terms, and I know we've discussed that. Um, and um, there's probably a, a reason why we why we haven't provided that. But if you want to address that, I think it would answer some people's questions. Okay. Um, yeah. So this is actually part of our uh, FAQ page as well because we've actually gotten that question uh, quite a bit. Um, but basically, because they're not yet part of an official release, that's why we're not making them available for download. Just because we need to sort of keep separation between here's the officially released link terms and here are the ones that are pre-release because otherwise when we start making the files available then we're going to run into a lot of questions about 
you know, versioning, and then we have to start versioning the pre-release codes and the code change. And I just think it would be, I think it, it, it seems easy in principle, but I think when it comes right down to actually making a CSV file or some other type of file available for download, I think there's a lot of details that we would have to take into consideration. And that's why we haven't actually done that yet. Um, and just, you know, keeping track of updates, like we would hate for people to download the pre-release terms now, and then if something changes, like a component change for a bunch of terms or, um, you know, the method change from IA to IA rapid, if you have the static file, then, you know, you might need some updates. Okay, great. Thanks, Mark. Um, there was a, a question that I think may go, may go to the group for, you know, uh, and that we may actually seek answers on. So let me just throw this one out there, not that we have the answer yet. Do you have any suspicion that the 2002-2003 virus will be renamed SARS-CoV-1? I certainly haven't heard anything about that. Has anyone on the team heard anything about that? So I actually, so what's interesting is I've seen it referred to as SARS-CoV-1 in I believe it's only been one uh, manufacturer's literature, but I have not seen it mentioned, you know, on either the ICTV or I read their nomenclature paper, um, you know, that they wrote to support their classification and naming of the virus. And I did not see that in their recommendations, uh, but I imagine if that were to happen, that it would be in that group. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so the next question is from Pam Banning. Um, when is it appropriate to use the special SARS email routing to LOINC versus the routine email submission process to get new assay information to the team? I know you've addressed it, but maybe we should reiterate. Sure, so any new requests for submission or for new codes uh, should go through the submissions Avenue and questions about codes or you know general questions related to SARS-CoV-2 should go through the special uh, special conference. Okay. Um, so up night, you seem to be dropping out a little bit, so I don't know if that's a, a connection issue or. Um, oh, okay. Thank just, you. You know, there were just a slight. You know, it, I mean, basically, we got most of the words, um, but just wanted to you know. I'll point it out if there's anything we could do about it. Um, so uh, we had a number of questions regarding uh, the special use uh, value set. Um, so, uh, some people reported they couldn't hear exactly what was said about that. Um, are they in fire? What is the use of the value sets? What is the intent of the value sets? Um, we also uh, had a question regarding the fire, uh, let's see, the group code will be a, an LG code for um, SARS-CoV-2 testing um, in fire. So those are sort of the questions and I guess we can kind of talk around that and try to zero in on some of the uh, issues surrounding special use value sets in fire. Um, okay, so for the special use value set, that well, we're trying. We're working on it right now, um, and so we might provide that as a pre-release. But we're just we're trying to figure out the technical details surrounding that. And so we will, um, you know, I'm sure we will post something and and tweet about it when that does become available. Um, and we've actually just during the past hour gotten you know a couple of emails from people offering to help uh, sort out the logistical details or the technical details related to that. So uh, so thank you very much for uh, people who have offered to help. Um, and then in terms of the group, so that will be part of the June release. Uh, we won't be releasing any LD codes or you know, specific group information uh, before the June release. But essentially the value set should mirror at least, you know, one of the groups um, for SARS-CoV-2. Okay, yes. Um, so I'm going to, we have a few more, we have a number of questions here for, uh, for Swapna for you two, but um, the, 
the next question I'm going to jump to is um, one for um, uh, for Ricky, if Ricky's still available and can answer a question. Uh, this is from uh, Robert Butterfield. Um, is APHL coordinating test results propagation directly to patients, or will it always come through EHRs? Some initial test results were just delivered by phone call. Not all tests may originate from healthcare provider. Yeah, so this is Ricky. Um, so our main purpose was to make sure that the public health labs can, can report electronically. If they can report electronically, it would go back to the provider um, on, on their end. So we're, we're um, supporting that and we're working on um, what we call an ETOR solution, so electronic test ordering and result reporting um, going forward, um, but it's not set up at the moment. So, so I don't have a yes, no answer for you as usual, <laughs> probably. Okay, great. Thanks, Ricky. Um, so I'm going to uh, pick a question that goes to Stan. Um, what would other institutions have to do to be able to pull together the same type of information that Intermountain has? I assume more than a parsing of LOINC and SNOMED CT codes. Yeah, uh, I mean those, you know, those things depend on a lot of other systems besides, you know, the lab testing system. So, you know, it it's uh, the systems that, you know, that that track beds and uh, track respirators and some of those things are things that come out of our um, just other management software and not, I'm not the expert actually, uh, but I can, uh, if people want to send me an email, I can, you know, uh, route your message to the people who actually created that and they could give you a better answer. But it is, you know, it's that information is probably coming from, from at least 10 different systems within Intermountain Healthcare to create that, uh, integrated dash dashboard. Okay, great. Thanks, Dan. I think that question uh, came from Mike Waters, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so I'm going to uh, jump back to the to the LOINC team um, and ask a question. Um, this is something that we've actually been tossing around, discussing, and thinking about internally. Uh, we've had questions about it uh, prior to this conference, and we have gotten um, several questions during the conference related to what is being done with LOINC to codify documents uh, related to the uh, assessments for um, uh, SARS-CoV-2 and documents and or document sections. And, you know, I can start off by saying that, you know, we basically started thinking about it. We've gotten, um, we have several possibilities. We're thinking of, you know, whether to create a single um, you know, COVID-19 disease assessment note and, you know, and or branch that out into several different, you know, types, you know, the LOINC document ontology is its own thing. And, you know, we'd have to be thinking about how to model it in there. But I think getting some sort of document type out there quickly is in addition to all the laboratory testing uh, LOINC terms that are currently coming out would be important. So if anyone, if Swapna, you or anyone on the LOINC team wants to add, please feel free. Um, I think it's just important to get other people's thoughts and understanding how they are naming and mapping their document terms. Um, so I think right now we really just need to gather information so that we don't, we don't create codes if we don't need them, but at the same time, we're able to create them soon enough if we do need them so that they'll be useful during this time. So I think if, if you are using the LOINC document ontology and document codes, then you have access to see which codes you are using or how these notes are being named in your systems. If you could contact us through our website and let us know, that would really help inform our, um, you know, what we do. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I have a question uh, for Tracy. Um, 
it's it's from Pam Banning. It's kind of it's, it's sort of a long question, so I'll I'll, I'll read the whole thing. Um, I've been hearing clinical decision support developers use vetted value sets like, like NLM's curated VSAC and to a lesser extent CDC's PHIN VA, VADs. CDS templates have to be approved by local review boards and they often look to these levels for pre-vetted information. There has been a notable lag during this pandemic to see a steward upload value sets probably no fault for everyone who's trying to deal with other matters. Does ONC have the authority or governance to help improve this portion of communication in the future? I don't know if Tracy was still on. Um, um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, we can. Um, Yes, actually, one of the members on our team um, has been able to help uh, upload or update some of the VSAC pages. If you want to send over the information, we can help upload or update those pages as well as our ISA page. Like I said, if there's any other additional information that we don't have listed on our pages, please send them our way and we'll make sure that we're updating continuously as soon as we get the information that something new is available. Great. Um, I, David, thank you so much for uh, mentoring and walking us through the Q&A. We know, this is Terry again, we know that there's still questions out there and we will work together to get them displayed so that, and to answer them and then display our answers so that you have that available. We really wanna thank everybody for coming today. Uh, we also wanna take this opportunity to verbally thank our funders. Most of our funders are helping us ensure that content gets delivered and is produced in a timely manner. Biomoreau, Center for Medicare and Medicaid, NIEHS, NLM, ONC, the Reagan Street Foundation, FDA. These are all critical partners for the work that you've been able to see today. We want to give them accolades for their ongoing support for this work. For slides and more, you can visit meeting.link.org. Um, we welcome you to share these slides, to educate more people, to share the recording that will also be published. And once again, thank you for spending three hours with us. It's, it's a long time and we're very grateful for that. So I hope everybody has a great rest of the day. Thank you.